Chuck. Um, I guess Sue, you said uh, Sue was on. So Sue, would you do us the honor of uh, recording the attendance, please? Sure. Councillor Morin Bello? Here. Councillor Flanagan? Here. Councillor Forrest? Present. Councillor Hill? Here. Councillor O'Connor? Here. Councillor Pelletier? Councillor Penelo? Here. Deputy Mayor Mazzarella? Here. And Mayor Michael Rell? Here. Thank you, uh, Sue. Appreciate that. You're welcome. Officially, uh, Dolores has retired as of uh, August 1st, so we wish her all the best. Um, it was a very nice email that she had sent out uh, um, explaining her uh, enjoyment over the last uh, almost 20 years working for the town of Wethersfield in the position of town clerk. We wish her well. Um, Gary, you would have uh, access to the list of callers, if we have any, for the public comment. So callers, as a reminder, I will call your phone number out. Um, if you're interested in speaking, you'll have five minutes to speak. Um, please give your name and address for the record. Um, and I will do my best to do it in the order that they called. There are two five minute opportunities, one at the beginning and one at the end. And I'm just going to go through. If you're not interested in speaking, um, you don't have to say anything. Otherwise, um, you know, after I'll, I'll move on to the next caller. So first caller is 860-306-9560. Hi, can you guys hear me? Yep. Yes. Hi, good evening. My name is Robin Barasa. I live at 248 Dale Road. I'm speaking tonight on behalf of myself and my family. I'd like to speak on behalf of the Weathersfield Police Department. I'm in support of the Weathersfield Police Department and the Weathersfield and High School and Middle School SRO positions. We are all aware that our police and police department are not perfect entities. But we believe, contrary to what a portion of the Weathersfield community would like us all to think, that our Weathersfield Police Department and the Weathersfield High School and Silas Dean Middle School SRO positions they are invaluable for the general safety and welfare of our residents, students, and staff in our schools. For the past three months or so, the police have been subject to protests, both peaceful and not, in efforts to defund them. While although there may be room for more training, I know the WPD prides themselves on this task. Crime is not getting softer, it's getting, and it's not getting less frequent. Myself and many Weathersfield residents who have been victims of crime, prefer to live in a community going forward where people abide by the very doable and livable laws that our state and local governments have made for us and that our police enforce. We don't want excuses for crime and criminals. We want a safe town and we want safe schools. If that means a well-appointed and trained police and SRO staff like we already have, then so be it. Some have voiced in our community to defund the police and remove the SRO positions. They would like to hire more social workers and school psychologists to deter, deter, deter excuse me, criminal activity. While I do believe there is a place for more of these positions, I certainly think that when my home might be getting robbed or a student is doing something serious that could harm the rest of the student population, then the police is who I would like to be called and so would many others in, in our community. Our voices of support of the police have been ridiculed, harassed, and criticized, all in the effort to silence us. No more will we stand by quietly while a few loud and unappreciative residents try to disparage our police, as well as our SROs. I do hope going forward that this council will continue to show support for our Weathersfield Police Department and school resource officers. We are counting on all of you to do so going forward. Thank you and have a good evening. Thank you, Robin. I appreciate it. And actually, let me just jump in, Gary, before you go to the next one. I, I believe we did get some uh, written correspondence into um, both Cheryl 
Cheryl's email and to um, Sue's email. So uh, we will read uh, just a brief uh, summary of those letters uh, as they came in uh, at the end of, um, do you wanna do it at the end of the first uh, public, um, public portion or should we do it at the end? I think we can probably do it at the end of the first public portion. And if any others come in to either Sue or to uh, you, Gary, we can add those into the, uh, um, sorry, a little distracted, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> into the uh, uh, record at that point. Yep, that's fine. I think there's uh, four, four or five. It is, it is difficult to see them coming in when we're on the Zoom, though. So I think the cutoff, I don't remember. Okay. Office three, but I'll, and I'll be do my the full uh, written letters uh, into uh, uh, both the town clerk into your office will be part of the record as well. So Correct. The written. Yeah, the full amount, the full will be in. Exactly, full letter. Thank you. Uh, next caller is area code eight six zero five six three six nine two three. Oh, there you go. Mr. Young. Hello, this is Robert Young, 20 Copper Mill Road, Weathersfield. Um, at the last town council meeting, I was uh, quite surprised at the very end where uh, uh, Dolores had uh, given her announcement that she was retiring. Um, I hope she, um, she and Wayne have, uh, have a great time in retirement, and I hope the best for her. Um, next. There's been a lot of talk about who's going to decide if schools close, if schools open, how they're going to operate, uh, whether it's uh, distant learning, whatever. Um, I, you know, I, I've made several comments over time, recent time, regarding uh, having our students learn distant. We could shut down some of our classrooms. Uh, and I think the last time I spoke was, I was more emphasizing after a lot of thought that our, our seniors and our juniors should be the two groups that should venture out on distant learning 100%. I think uh, uh, this would free up building uh, classrooms in our school. We could move students up physically into rooms. I know we need more room now with this pandemic. Um, and it just might be a good way of, of moving along. Uh, we, could we could resist putting in any more of these temporary buildings that we put in. And, uh, you know, my understanding is Crick, who has an operation in Weathersfield, has, has already teaching going on where one teacher is teaching a class in numerous Crick operations. And this is what we could be doing. We could piggyback off of what Crick is doing and with our seniors at the moment. Uh, and and they, could, they could be learning from one teacher their history, whatever kind of history it is, their science, whatever science it is. Uh, we should be able to buy these presentations and we could eliminate a teacher, two teachers, more teachers. It doesn't matter. Eliminating, and we could we could get into at least bringing our students, the juniors and the seniors, along on this distant learning. Let's face it; these students right now that I'm talking about, they've been tuned into computers for quite a while. Town of Weathersfield School District District has been buying these Chromebooks for a number of years. I mean, I've been attending classes where uh, classes. I've attended meetings where they voted and bought more, more computers. So it's not like we don't have them. And I do know we now have plenty, which really makes me wonder what's going on. I mean, it was no more than a couple months ago, the superintendent bought 2,000 more Chromebooks. It was back in, I think, January or sometime before the pandemic came along that <clears throat> he bought another thousand. That's 3,000 computers that he bought. 
and he was and he and when he bought that one thousand back prior to the pandemic, he had he had mentioned that this would have given all the students in the school system a laptop or a Chromebook, whatever you want to call it. But then shortly thereafter, he grabs two more thousand. So, you know, a number of things come to mind. What's happening with those older computers, those older um, Chromebooks? Are they selling them? Are they, is there some revenue that we should be seeing coming in? Or do they just get rid of them and the money slides off somewhere else and nobody talks about it? But, it, but coming back to we have the resources to to really bring on distant learning for at least our seniors and juniors. And we should be working on a constant basis for those younger ones who have the ability to learn distant and, and work with them and get them tuned in as well. And that would free up space within our school for those who, who can't do it as well on a computer from home. And, you know, we could save a lot of money in the end, uh, Mayor. You know, uh, you, you ran on the uh, position that you were going to cut costs, and you only, you only cut no cost except for there was no increase in this last budget. And I would hope that this next budget we could save a big chunk being taken out of the budget. Um, I just think it's, a, a, I think it's an ideal time. You know, and we citizens are getting hammered. I know, you're citizens as well. But we're all hearing now about the uh, Eversource. And they're a big jack, jack up in their, in their monthly uh, bills. I saw mine go up, and I wondered what's going on. And uh, you know, now we're listening on the, phone, on the television, and we're hearing what really happened or what we some for what they're saying. And Mr. what they're Gil saying is, if you minute, could, yeah, I'll uh, wrap it up. I'll wrap right. it up, and it seems like one guy from from Eversource said, "Well, all those commercial businesses are not buying electric because they're closed, and now they shifted the rates to okay. the residents." Okay. Yep. So, right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Next is. Eight six zero nine four four six seven six five. Hi, uh, good evening. Can you hear me? This is Michelle Lavoy from Sixteen Westwood Drive. Yes. Hi, Michelle. Hi, thank you. I'd like to just um, read some facts and uh, speak on behalf of our Weathersfield Police Department and the great job that they do. Um, in twenty sixteen. Uh, I'm going to start with some federal facts. In 2016, Charles Wade, who was a founder of Operation Help or Hush, he was also a significant role in assisting Black Lives Matter activists. He was actually charged with sex crimes against a 17-year-old girl in keeping teenagers who had apparently um, looked to him for temporary housing. And he said his organization handled large numbers of temporary housing requests for people in need and that he had treated that young woman's situation accordingly. Also in 2016, the National Human Trafficking Hotline received as many as 193 calls reporting 54 cases of trafficking. 46 of those calls were made by victims themselves. Recently, just this week, another Black Lives Matter activist was also charged with human trafficking. Uh, the Jackson police officer said, uh, this is a great quote, but I can say that generally speaking, people should be very cautious about listening to voices suggesting defunding of the police because their motives are not always in the best interest of society. Between 20, 2006 and 2016, there were 432 child victims of human trafficking in this state. Of these cases, only 28 cases were prosecuted. In May of 2018, a federal jury in New Haven found Tony Kelsey of Hartford, 26, 
guilty of sex trafficking of minors. The investigation had been conducted by the Federal Bureau of Investigation, Connecticut State Police, Homeland Security, our own Weathersfield Police Department, and Hartford Police Department, all working through the Connecticut Human Trafficking Task Force. Also in 2016 at a Weathersfield High School football game, Detective James Darby was working private duty when a concerned youth approached him about a man in distress. The detective was joined by our school's resource officer, Eric Knapp, and one other person. The three got the man to start breathing again, but since he still had no pulse, the trio kept applying chest compressions until the ambulance arrived. Using an AED, the man's heartbeat was brought back into rhythm. Thank you to all those people who saved that life that night. I took a sampling of 20 Weathersfield police officers. Those 20 officers hold 344 years of service. Although in that 344 years of service, weapons were only discharged in the line of duty six times. Four were to kill already injured and suffering animals. One was to kill a charging bull who had already killed a farmer. One time to defend against a perp firing his gun at police at close range, the suspect which had already killed an innocent female. The most recent Weathersfield incident was not including in this because that officer is no longer on the force. So if you would like to include that shooting to make it two defensive uses, you also have to add his years of service to the 344 years. Of the 24 officers I interviewed, zero reports of abuse of force were reported. Conversely, one officer was shot at on three different occasions. Another was shot at, attacked and bitten by a violent human. One officer was assaulted and the criminal charge was allowed to plea at a lesser charge even though he had documented injuries. Quite a few noted how tough it has been most recently to go to work every day to protect and save the lives of our people in Weathersfield only to be villainized by the community, especially on social media. Most disturbingly have been reports of officers in our state and families being threatened. In fiscal 2009 and 2012, Connecticut law changed radically to include 16 and 17 year olds as juvenile offenders, removing them from adult courts. The victims have been our, our own community. Stolen Ms. cars being demolished. Yes. Michelle, uh, if you don't mind, can you just summarize and wrap up? Uh, we do have a five minute um, public hearing or public yes. court in the beginning and another one at the end. So if you can you know, okay. summarize in the next 30 seconds, we would appreciate it. The most disturbing story is the 10 year old boy from my neighborhood waiting for the bus who one morning was attacked by these four, four juveniles. I'm appalled that our leaders could vote for a bill that 98% of Connecticut residents did not agree with. They didn't even ask. Chris Murphy does not, no longer even live in Connecticut. How did we let this happen? I'm just really appalled and I don't have any words to describe the anger that I feel over the new bill that has been passed. And I know that my feelings are shared with at least 98% of the citizens of this state. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Mayor, that's all I have listed for callers. Okay. Anybody else who may be on the line that may want to speak at all? Yeah, I have no other phone number okay. listed. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, we have no hearings or ordinances. Uh, and resolutions, uh, no hearings on those. Um, reports from boards and commissions. Uh, any members have any reports from boards or commissions? Councilwoman Bell. Thank you, Mayor. Um, the library board met via Zoom last Tuesday, the 28th. Um, Martha Keneally is the new board chair. The board discussed their reopening plans 
Um, beginning today, the library is open 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Monday through Saturday um, by appointment for either computer use or to pick up library materials that you had um, previously put on hold. Um, the librarians will, library staff will actually pull the books and put them in a bag for you and then you just come in and, and um, pick up your, your bag of books. Um, the fax and copier services are also back up and running at the library. Um, the browsing collection is not available in this phase in and they're hoping to add additional services after Labor Day. The board also made some minor changes to their behavior and tech policies um, for COVID. Part of it is so that they felt they were able to enforce, uh, enforce a mask wearing policy and also um, that the library director would have some discretion with the length of time patrons can use their computers. Uh, and the board did vote it on their year end transfers. They were transfer, they're transferring $20,367 back to the town, I believe to the general fund and the remainder, which is um, just over 2,800 will go back to the library employees compensated absences account uh, if council is agreeable to that. So that's the highlights of the latest um, library board meeting. Thank you. And uh, please give my best to uh, Doreen and thank you for her service to uh, the library board. Uh, I know she's put in a number of years as uh, chairwoman of that board and has done a, a great job uh, with those folks. So she sure do, has. Do appreciate it. Anyone else? Any updates? Councillor Hill. Uh, thanks, Mayor. On July 16th, I attended the Brainerd Noise Committee hearing uh, via Zoom. Uh, the noise complaints in Old Weathersfield have grown drastically from quarter to quarter. It jumped from 40 complaints to 215 over the last quarter, um, 15 of those being the jet complaints due to the Travelers Championship. Um, the flight uh, tower was involved in this um, call. Uh, his uh, rationale was that they've had a tremendous increase in the population of the flight school. He believes a lot of people are shifting careers towards that uh, during the pandemic. Uh, and with uh, the increase in the population of the flight school, you have uh, new pilots going out and what they have to do is they go up and they circle several times around, which is why they're getting several complaints over just one plane at a time. Um, the flight towers involved, they continue to educate not only the pilots, uh, but the flight schools about where to fly, and they'll continue to do that um, as they move forward. Uh, they do also have uh, new projects coming in. They've installed a new security system, and uh, excitingly, they, have a new, they do have a new restaurant opening up now that the Flying Monkey has moved, and that's open within the next uh, 90 days or so. Okay. Thank you, Kevin. Um, yes, it's been a issue for anybody who lives in Old Weathersfield or for that matter, you know, anywhere in Weathersfield at some point, those airplanes do, uh, who tend to not fly the, the required, not required, but requested route above the river uh, and in. So um, I appreciate that. Anyone else with any updates from boards or commissions? Hearing none. Okay, thank you. Um, we'll go to council action. No referral to regular business. So um, I think we can go right into uh, resignations and appointments. I believe there are a couple from both um, Amy and Tom. Um, Tom, I believe you are up with a couple or at least one resignation. I make a motion to accept the resignation of Michael Vera, 116 Black Birch Road, uh, from a term of 7-18-16 to 6-30-21. And uh, I can do the appointments as well, right? At this point. Uh, why don't we just get one? Um, well, well, it's just one resignation. We'll get one resignation done. Okay. Second motion. 
motion's been made and seconded on the resignation. Any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Ayes have it. I'll be a little bit slower next time, so anybody has to push the mute button, they can get back on. Uh, and then uh, appointments, uh, I believe, order, Councilwoman Bello. Thank you, Mayor. Um, before I do that, do we accept Dolores' resignation? Is that something we do officially or not? Um, probably would be good practice to do so, just in case. I can't think of a reason why you couldn't or shouldn't. I think we appoint the town manager and the town clerk, so would we do? accept the resignation as well? I'm not, I'm not actually sure, but it, Yeah, I, I, I would say just for, uh, again, off the top of my head, I'm not sure if you can or cannot, or you should or should not, but I, there's nothing wrong with doing so, so probably to err on the side of safety, if it's supposed to be a formal acceptance, then you probably could or probably should. I can make a motion to open the agenda for the resignation of Dolores Cesano as town clerk. Actually, I don't I don't even know if you need to. It's on the agenda as acceptance of recognitions from oh. boards, I guess maybe, because yeah. you're considered not on a board and commission. Recognition to boards and commissions. Um, I mean, we can hold <laughs> off. And we can hold off till September if you want to see what what yeah. has happened in the past or what the process is, but um, I'm, it may be something we're supposed to do. I don't know. Sorry, we're having a little technical difficulty at the same time. Okay. Yeah, I, yeah, I would probably. I'll withdraw the motion. Because yeah. you're right, it's not a board or a commission and that's what we have on the agenda. So we'll continue with. Maybe, maybe we, I was just going to say, maybe someone should reach out to Dolores and tell her she doesn't have to come into work because we're trying to figure out what she's upset <laughs> You know, you say that here, yeah, that's good. but she's been here almost, you know, a couple times a week. I've, I've thrown her out of the building a couple times trying to explain to her she doesn't have to come in and she works here. So, but I, I'll research <laughs> it and I'll get back to you. <laughs> Thank you, Gary. And yeah, between you and uh, Sue, you guys can research that for the September 8th. I'll check into it. Meeting. Thank you. Uh, okay, continuing on with the agenda, appointments to boards and commissions. Okay, happy to appoint Diane Dute, uh, 420 Church Street to the Central Connecticut Health District for a term beginning August 3rd, 2020 to June 30th, 2023. Okay. Motion's been made and seconded. Any discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. Motion aye. 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 Opposed nay. Ayes have it. Thank you. Continuing on with appointments. Make a motion to Point the following under constables John J. O'Leary, PO Box 290002, a term of 7 620 to 63022. Under Board of Building Appeals, an alternate Stephen L. Andrea, 430 Main Street from 7 620 to 63023. <clears throat> from planning and zoning to correct the term error. David Drake, 200 Windmill Hill, from 7620 to 63022. And on the Veterans Commission, Mark A. Rudowitz, 6 Timber Trail, from 8320 to 63022. Second. Motion's been made and seconded. I don't know, Sue, do you? Can you see who's making the motions and, and well, obviously, you know, the motions, but seconding. Okay. Thank you. You're still muted. Okay. Motion's okay, been I'm, I'm good. Thank you. 
Okay. Motion's been made and seconded. Any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay? Ayes have it. Thank you. We do have the resolution and Gary, do you have a copy? You can do a, everybody, and I do apologize. Uh, it did, you know, I, we worked on it today and then um, I got it over to Gary and uh, it was posted, I think a little after 3.30, you said Gary, um, and then Sue in the town clerk's office had finalized it. Unfortunately, it just never got to uh, the council in time for uh, a full review, but you do have a, a copy of it in front of you on both email. And Gary, do you have a copy that you could do a screen share? Is it showing up? It is, but you may need to blow it up a little bit. I'm trying to get the whole thing on the screen. So what I'll do, hang on. I'll just kind of scroll up as we get there. Thank you, Gary. And this tonight is uh, just for introduction. Uh, there will be a public hearing on Tuesday, September 8th, which will be our next council meeting. Uh, Monday the 7th is Labor Day. Uh, we will have a uh, um, public hearing for uh, the resolution and uh, hopefully we can vote to uh, um, adopt this um, then. So. Mayor, will this be made available on the town website or through Facebook or some way for residents to see it? Most definitely, yes. If I'm not mistaken, it, Gary, is it posted already? Or had it been posted already or It not may yet? not be, but we'll, I'll have um, IT get it up please. Yes. Awesome. Thank you. And be shared and please um, make it as public as possible. Yep. 
I'll actually send it right now as we speak. Gary, did okay. you, I'm guessing that you, and maybe my, uh, I guess I don't know, um, who had their hand in drafting this? Um, it was kind of a uh, com combined effort between myself, uh, Gary, and um, we worked um, for about a week last week on it and were able to share it with uh, uh, some folks uh, over the weekend to be able to come up with something today. That's great. Um, just a quick question as I read it. The first sentence, I was just wondering if you had any sort of input for me, especially the end of it, in erodes the strength of society through the waste of human resources. Maybe I'm not understanding necessarily what that's getting at, but if there was any background, um, it would be helpful. Yeah, um, I, can, I can take it, Gary, or you want to take it? Yeah, I'll just, I'll, I'll chime in. Some of this was based off of what was previously um, looked at by uh, other communities across the state of Connecticut. Um, that was one of them that was, um, that came out. I don't think by that term, human resources, they necessarily mean the department, like a department of human resources, but it, that it drains, um, um, kind of pulls people in different directions. Mm -hmm. it's, that was my take on it. Having read uh, some of the iterations that we had seen from other towns and um, some other cities outside of Connecticut, they had used um, similar language uh, to this in that it, um, you know, utilizes resources, um, unfortunately utilizes uh, resources of not only the town, but of the expertise of uh, professionals to um, have to bear witness to, um, to the issue and to work on it when, uh, when we really shouldn't be, you know, shouldn't have. And the next level is it prevents talented individuals who would otherwise fit a position or fit, um, you know, be able to move and uh, grow uh, based off of who they are and where they came from. So it, in other words, it's not allowing that talent to, to be put in place because of discriminatory practices. Yeah. Thank you. I didn't necessarily get that from the language. You may want to consider maybe saying something maybe a little bit more directly or, and, and I don't necessarily disagree with it, but it's not really clear, I think, from that waste of human resources. If it's, if it's the concept that, you know, discriminatory practices um, we talk about erode the strength of society because it divides us more than it unites us or something like that, right? That seemed to be a little bit of the flavor that I was sort of hearing from the mayor. And, and you talked a little bit more about the, the ability to take, use our talent in an effective and efficient way. Those might be two different, completely different concepts. So just some food for thought about that particular language. Mm -hmm. Appreciate it. Mayor. Councilwoman Bella. Thank you. Um, I, w will you be properly naming this resolution? Because I see what's before us just says resolution, and we'll, we'll need to be able to identify it by, I think, an appropriate title. Uh, I, yeah, if I may, I, I did see that, and um, I think the title of it, which was also included in the agenda packet, um, standing against the resolution that Weathersfield stands against racism. Yeah, this. So that'll be how it's advertised in the public hearing and it'll be presented to us in the next, uh, at the next council meeting with that title. Yeah. Yeah, so I don't know if you can see the top of the screen at the very top, it says Weathersfield stands against racism resolution. That's, it probably should have been worded similarly within the document. So I'll correct that. Perfect. So that that way, when um, a legal notice of hearing goes out, it's got the appropriate title so that the public will realize what the resolution is about. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions on this introduction? Resolution. 
Okay. Thank you. Move to uh, item 4A, year and year end transfers. Do we have Mike O'Neill on? Or Gary? Yep, we're both here. Here. Okay. Um, hang on, yep. my screen's a little bit delayed. No problem. But this is, you know, standard practice after the adoption of a budget. Um, yep. You know, hope to be in surplus after the uh, budget adoption, sometimes in deficit. Unfortunately, we found ourselves on the um, positive side of about 1.6 million. And um, there are some transfers to accounts from contingency that we have to make. It's spelled out in the agenda or in the uh, um, item. And the rest would be transfers to other funds or to budget reserve. So, um, Gary. That, yeah, that was basically the summary. Um, Mike, if you want, I can, do you want to bring it up or do you want me to bring up the document? I can, uh, I can bring it up. Can everyone see that? <laughs> Unfortunately, no. Just a little bit more. Oh, you mean you can see it, it's just not big enough. Oh, yes, right. Yes, I'm sorry. I can see it. Just can't read it. How's that? <laughs> do much better than that. There, um, if you want to get everything in, you can probably. Yeah, you're just going to have to scroll. Can you see uh, my cursor at the bottom there on that black bar? Yep. Yes. Yeah. How about up here? Yes. Top and the black. Okay, so that's that's the bulk of it there. <clears throat> Shall I go ahead and run through this? Sure. Okay. I mean, yep. So, um, as the mayor mentioned, um, we are in the process of closing out uh, the prior fiscal year, which ended on June thirtieth, um, and part of that is. Uh, it's uh, the, the council is required or um, allowed, I guess, if it wishes to make any changes to the budget uh, to do that uh, as, long, as long as it's prior to September 30th by charter. So um, we, have, uh, we have paid all the bills um, that we are aware of. We've closed purchase orders uh, that are no longer needed and we are uh, showing an unexpended amount from the budget of approximately $1.6 million. Um, the bulk of that is from really from three sources, uh, the contingency, which was not used at all, and um, sizable balances in parks and recreation and physical services, um, both related primarily to uh, COVID-19, you know, the impact of the shutdown of the schools and uh, recreation programs in the community center and the senior center. Um, we also had a fairly favorable uh, winter um, in terms of storms and overtime and road supplies, which contributed to that as well. Um, but in physical services, recall also that um, this was the first year we budgeted for uh, utilities for the school buildings. And there was um, a considerable amount of unexpended funds there. And again, because, you know, primarily because of the, uh, the shutdown of the buildings. So we're left with $1.6 million unexpended. That can, um, we have to do a couple of things. This column shows that, there, you know, where there were over expenditures in five departments. So there's uh, in the motion, there's a component to reconcile, to, to address those overages. Um, I can just speak to those briefly. Town manager and town attorney are over budget, um, both related to uh, legal expenditures. And that's an issue that we've talked about during the budget process. Um, those are amounts that we've budgeted and not increased. Um, so we've become um, somewhat used to seeing uh, negative variances 
in those lines. Um, probate court was over budget because we, um, we did not get the final bill in the prior year until after year end, until after we had closed the books. So we had to pay five quarters um, in this past year instead of four quarters for them. So that's, you know, that's the amount that we pay roughly per quarter. Tax assessor is over budget. Um, you may recall about a year and a half ago, we instituted personal property audits um, with a firm uh, that operates on a contingency basis. That means that they only charge us fees if they discover uh, taxable property. So, um, and we understood that we, um, there was the possibility of overexpending what we had budgeted for that line. Um, but the, what we have to bear in mind is that the work is done on a contingency basis. So to the extent that we pay fees for those audits, we also uh, have discovered taxable property. So there's a, there's a revenue impact that outweighs the fees. You just don't see them um, in the same place in the budget. So, you know, the impact, the revenue impact is on the, is, is in taxes on the revenue side. Um, so that's, that's uh, an overage there. And the police department's uh, over budget. And that is uh, due to the fact that um, the police union was in negotiations um, at the beginning of the last fiscal year. And it is our practice to uh, budget a 0% increase in the department and to make a provision elsewhere in the budget for uh, any potential uh, increase in wages. Of course, there, there was an increase, you know, when the contract was, um, when the contract was, uh, agreement was reached. And so the actual number reflects the increase um, specified by the contract. But again, we did not budget that amount there. So you do see an overage. So the first component is just a balancing of those. Uh, you would be uh, transferring budget appropriation from the contingency line to those lines, basically just to balance them off to zero. Um, this column just shows after those reconciliation transfers, the amount of unexpended funds available. You can see that remains 1.6 million. Um, it's just that the, the dollars are moved around um, out of contingency and into those other lines. This column, which is uh, column four, is just shows some proposed uh, transfers that are um, included in the motion. This would involve moving appropriations from the lines indicated to this line, the transfers line, which would then allow us to transfer $917,000 to, um, to various projects in other non-lapsing funds. And just to show you what those are, um, this component at the, at the bottom of the spreadsheet just um, lists out uh, various, uh, first is the compensated absences, um, which is a fund we maintain to uh, cover any payment of accrued leave, sick, or vacation uh, for employees when they leave, depending on the provisions of their contract. Um, so there's $2,800. Um, Councilor um, Bellow had mentioned that when she gave the library report. There are five uh, CIP projects that uh, um, are proposed for funding. So that money would be moved into the capital improvements uh, fund. And then there are four uh, projects uh, for the capital non-recurring expenditure fund. Recall that's where we pay for equipment and vehicles. And again, those items total up to 917,000. Uh, that comes out of the 1.6 million that's, that was not expended leaving $756,000, which would lapse the fund balance, would increase fund balance. <clears throat> the other, I uh, just run up to the top of the page here, bear with me. Um, we also had a favorable year on the revenue side and that's just summarized in this section at the top. Um, we were over budget 
by 350,000 approximately. That number will change a bit as we uh, continue to close out the year and undergo our audit. Um, so that amount uh, would go to fund balance as well. In addition to uh, the $400,000 that was budgeted for uh, use of fund balance, which was not used. So when we report fund balance in the audit, this $13 million number, um, it is net of any plans that we have made to use that. So it's that 400,000 is not in the 13 million. We add it back here. So there's another uh, $7 million that are 700,000, roughly 750, that would also lap the funds, fund balance in addition to the amount um, from expenditures. I have succeeded in putting everyone to sleep. <laughs> no, thank you. Not at, not at all. Mike, we appreciate it. No, no problem. Not only, uh, you can, let me just ask, does everybody have the agenda in front of them with these uh, tables in them? So um, we don't have to have uh, Mike's screen sharing for right now, or do you guys want to have that back up there? I have one quick question before we take that down, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, the physical services line, uh, so we're, we're, we have, we're over by 511 and we're, what's the difference between 511 and 342? Where is that? So we are, we're, so this, uh, this column is, so we would increase the transfer line by the 917. That's the increasing the appropriation, which would allow us to move these funds into those, those, uh, those funds, sorry. Sure, but, but I was so looking. In, in, okay, if I may. Yeah, these amounts, uh, really can come from anywhere. It doesn't, I, you know, I just literally kind of started from the bottom up um, in those dollars, because we're not taking everything, we're only taking 917,000 out of the 1.6. If we were taking everything, you would see negatives on all these lines. So just, there's no, yeah, it's accounting. It's kind of, uh, you know, there's no rhyme or reason really to why I chose these lines versus others. Okay, okay. So for the line 0520 physical services, you see that there's the 511 and you're taking the 342 and that was just accounting. Yes. To determine that you're taking the 342. That was just a, you know, that was my balance. So we, we take everything on this line, everything here, all of this, all of this, all of this. We take the 2,800 from the library. We take the 51,000 from IT up above, and then to, to get to the 917, I need that number. So you, you could have if I you taken it from anywhere. I could put anywhere. Dollar. Engineering, right? You could have gone each line up, but for so I guess state. my question is why 917 to 24? Because this this was a list of projects that was identified. And if you add them together, it's 917. So this is what drives, so, so first this list is developed and then the accounting is done. And this list was developed by you and the town manager? Who? Yeah, we put together, we put together a list uh, that, you know, would use the whole 1.6 million and then met with the mayor and the deputy mayor to discuss that and this is what came out of that meeting. So what would be some of the items that you had on the original list that didn't make it to this list? Mm -hmm. Gary, do you have that in front of you? Um, I think Mike is, it looked yeah. like Mike was bringing it up. Yep, so that would be uh, items totaling 756,000. 400 of that was uh, just a, a 
movement of funds to the undesignated CIP account for the items that were removed during the budget process from the CIP, except for these that are listed here. So, so we took out 300 and Gary, was it 356,000? 326. 326. We took out of uh, the $900,000 list that came from um, CIAC when we put together the proposed budget. So we had, uh, Gary and I had put 400 back in, which was that 326 plus the, the recommended item that was not in the 900,000, but came from CIAC, which was the Keisha Farm Master Plan. So these were the these were the items that survived from that 400, were these right here. Um, we had also proposed 100,000, and again, this was just for the for the sake of using the whole 1.6 million, um, and giving you know for the sake of the discussion, you know, it was kind of a, a comprehensive list of items to discuss and choose from. Um, it also included $100,000 to the road fund, which. Um, the thought behind that was that the $1.8 million appropriation had been reduced by 100,000 during um, uh, budget deliberations to fund the pools. And we had 300,000 on the list for the phone system. Right. And we had about 100,000 more on this vehicle reserve line. Amy, I didn't know if you were done. Maybe I could hop in, Mayor. Mm -hmm. Amy, just checking in. Are you you all set? Oh yeah, I'm. I'm still processing. Go right ahead. <clears throat> sure. Um, so I, I'm I'm gathering that there's been there's there's a number of items that were on the 1.6. They were part of the CIP. Did you go down the list in priority order that the uh, the capital improvement committee? uses and you just worked your way backwards or was there other some of these other considerations that you know continue to move some of those things around because every year obviously we get a list and they do their work and put them in a priority and we allocate a certain amount of money so I didn't know if that list was also used well I can jump in real quick and um, you know give some of what we're looking at right there from CIP, the high crest boiler improvement, um, just because, and we'll see it on the agenda later on, that is kind of a priority for the high crest school to get that um, HVA system, the new system in compliance with the uh, current code. Uh, the town hall chiller, again, that is also um, kind of on its last legs. And, um, you know, we're nervous about, um, you know, it going out in not only the town hall, but in the library where we need um, you know, climate controlled uh, air you know, handling systems for the, um, the books and the uh, shelves uh, in there. Hanmer and Charles Wright flooring, um, that also uh, was originally in the uh, CIP last year and I believe we took that money out for the roof work that was done at Silestein Middle School. So we felt that that needed to be uh, back in there. And um, you know, we do have the Keisha property that we bought uh, and we uh, have a committee that's working on that right now. So um, we figured that that needs to be done um, soon so we can start to uh, develop a plan for that property. And then as far as the Board of Ed surplus um, capital reserve, I believe typically we do that to the 2% uh, the fund for the Board of Ed. Um, both Matt and, uh, and Kevin, you've been on the Board of Ed. Uh, I believe that has always been the case where if there's extra surplus for that, that we could put it into uh, the Board of Ed's capital improvement program for any capital uh, projects in the future. Yeah, there's. There's no doubt that we've got, you know, tons of projects, of course, that are well deserving. Mm -hmm. But I was wondering if the list was used, and it looks like if the list was used, if it was used in order, 
well, did it go back to the CIP uh, group to, to say, hey, look, you know, we're looking at this particular, I don't know if I want to call it a surplus because it's a very dicey word in this particular, the way we do the accounting here, but mm -hmm. this particular amount of funds. And do we reorder it? Do we re know? I mean, I haven't seen, uh, there may be, there may be discussion points here where a priority moves up or priority moves down. Right. Um, but this is the first time, obviously, that we're, some, some of us, obviously, a couple of you have been taking a look at this and, and this might be great, but I didn't see what the other CIP, what the other projects in town were, whether and how to measure quantitatively or qualitatively, whether they should be up or down. Mm -hmm. And I mean, my, the first thing that just sort of point gets out to me is there's 200,000 for radio reserves. And I remember we're talking to the radio reserve guy. And honestly, the urgency of that particular amount of money was not really felt. In fact, there was sort of like a, you know, we should be doing this, but there's like some room to cut here. And I think we all remember that sort of conversation. And while uh, there's different sets of urgencies for different things, but without sort of a full look at um, CNEF funds and the CIP funds to sort of get that feeling to at least express some guidance, uh, you know, toward the use of these particular sets of resources. So mm -hmm. is it possible to um, see what is on the table and get an understanding of that? Um, I think we can share the, what CIP came up with for their proposal. Um, right. Is right, it, jump I, in. I'm sorry, Tom, go right ahead. Been there and explain a couple of the items. Sure. So Matt, if you look at the top, the first one, the compensated absence from the library, that, that was something totally new, wasn't on any CIP list or anything. The Highcrest boiler room improvements was an emergency yeah. uh, problem that just came up. So that was not CIP either. Um, and then going down to the CNEF, the radio reserves. So those reserve amounts are typically in the budget each year. So the last year, for example, the radio uh, payment was a little over 400,000, I think it was 405. So half of it came from the reserves and half of it came from the budget process. And the same thing goes with the undesignated reserves. It's used to reduce how much we have to come up with in the next budget. Those are pretty much standard each year, from what I understand. Uh, Deputy Mayor, for which, for the undesignated reserves? That's 200,000. That's capital non-recurring, non right? Yes, rolling stock. What, mm -hmm. What's that? I believe it's part of the rolling stock. The, well, it, it, Mike, you could jump in, but is that uh, paying the lease payments? Yes, so in both cases, what we would anticipate with both um, of those $200,000 contributions uh, to the reserves would be to hold those. There's no uh, foreseen need. Um, well, the purpose would be to hold those to be able to use them in the next budget cycle to offset the lease payments, which would in effect um, put you sort of at the same starting point as we, as we you know, enter the budget next year. So that, uh, you know, that money would be available to reduce lease payments. You wouldn't be faced with immediately um, having to deal with the full amount of the lease payments. Hey, uh, thank you for that. I, and the lease payments, I understand, for the radio reserve, but what are the lease payments under the undesignated? Those are for uh, streetlights, catone, turf, uh, rolling stock, and uh, equipment at, uh, you know, uh, rolling equipment at uh, physical services, dump trucks, payloader, and the fire And trucks. all of that was in the budget previously, but then the, all, all of those items were removed in, our, in the most recently budget, adopted budget? Is that, is no. that accurate? No. No. Help, help me fix that inaccuracy sure. then. Okay, bear with me. Sure. <clears throat> It sounds like that would be accurate as it relates to the radio reserves. The the two hundred thousand was removed, and now we're replenishing it. And we typically, 
for lack of a better term, have a $200,000 radial reserve. And then we each year add in whatever balance is needed. Is that generally accurate? Kind of like putting money away in advance, Matt. So right. let me I understand that for the radar reserves. Pay, so now I'm just trying to figure out the undesignated. Because nothing's labeled, right? It's just like a giant fund. So I'm, I apologize for having to, uh, you know, use numbers off the top of my head here. But, and, and I won't be precise, but current leases outstanding we have on the order of $1.7 million worth of payments for principal and interest on those leases in this current fiscal year. During the budget process, we, uh, the council adopted the budget that incorporated the use of, I believe it was about $450,000 of reserves to reduce that 1.7 million. So the thought behind this is to replace, but put $400,000 back into those accounts to be available to use in the same way during the next budget cycle. So that you get to next year, the number won't be exactly 1.7 million because I know we have uh, some smaller leases that run off. Mm -hmm. but, so let's call it $1.6 million. Um, if you don't have reserves to help subsidize that 1.6 million, you've got a, you've already got a, you're starting with an increase, you know, on the order of $400,000 on that line to deal with. This puts you in a position to, to use reserves again in the next budget cycle to sort of, you know, stabilize the, the cost on that line. So I understand the concept, but I'm trying to understand the difference in the amount that we had last budget and then the amount that we adopted this budget. So is it $400,000 less that we've used? I mean, uh, that we adopted. So if we had a million last year in reserves, then you know we took $400,000 out to balance this particular budget. So we're 400 short. Oh, we're 400 less, yes. Than the previous budget. Allocation. 400 less today. After the after the beginning of this fiscal year, then we had the yeah, close of twenty twenty. Yep. Okay. So we're just simply replenishing that four hundred thousand back. Is that accurate, Mike? Yes. We actually and we used we used fifty one thousand dollars from the streetlight reserve, which was the end of that reserve. There's and so that account that money just goes away. So we used about 451,000. We're putting 400 back. Now on the vehicle reserve, I mean, we've, you know, talked about dump trucks, I'm sure Tom knows about that, of course. And like, I never remember like, hey, you know, we'll just pull it out of the vehicle reserve. Is that a different type of an account? We always, you know, we pay for it out of a contingency or a different account. Can you tell me a little bit about the vehicle reserve or is that a new kind of concept that we're gonna be working with? Or am I just not remembering something in the past, which is possible? Is that me or? I guess it was, it was really more to Mike, but I just thought you'd appreciate the fact that we talked about dump trucks because you were integral in you know, that analysis. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to shift away from leasing all of our vehicles to buying them outright. Sure. So the 150,000 is gonna be set aside for future purchases rather than a lease option. So is this kind of a, I'm going to use the word lightly, but I think it applies like a, po a policy. And I, I really mean that sort of lightly, like we're going to attempt through this particular, a, a line item that we're going to see in future budgets to sort of prepay some of this stuff and prepay is not really the right term, but set aside an amount of resources in order to purchase it. So we're not leasing and then paying financial costs and the rest of it, which I'm totally down with Tom because we've been trying mm -hmm. to do this. The money's really there. It's just a matter of, you know, putting it in this reserve fund rather than just in the fund balance. So when we do, if we do decide to buy, uh, say, two police cruisers during, the, during this year, we would have money there for that. Right. We wouldn't have to go to special appropriation or, 
Okay. And was there gu is there guidance that we're sort of looking at in order to sort of wean our way off of the lease uh, train, I guess you might say? I, well, there's no guidance. I mean, I think we've been doing that for the last couple of years. We're trying to purchase vehicles outright rather than lease them. Um, you know, I think uh, the Board of Ed has done that with uh, uh, Chromebooks sometimes, and um, we're trying to do that with some of our vehicle purchases in the past. We've done it um, just to be able to get off of the, the lease pay, uh, payment option. Yeah, for sure. So this is just going to be the vehicle by which we can uh, allocate, specifically allocate for those particular purchases. Is that generally accurate? That 150,000? Yeah. Yes. Yep. Okay. Um, you know, I think it would be good to have a conversation, or I'd like to have a conversation, but only the will of the council will rule here. I mean, we see what has sort of been recommended, and maybe, in fact, the recommendations are great. But, I, but this comes from a bigger, a much, much larger conversation of outstanding CIPs with different CNEF. We just talked about a new uh, vehicle reserve policy, which even in its concept, I think I completely agree with. Never liked paying banks essentially for you know what we say, what we consider not just rolling stock, but even just regular operating expenses. It's always sort of dangerous. Um, but I'd like to have a larger conversation of what was outstanding uh, in the in the entire essence. So mm -hmm. um, perhaps we can hear from other counselors. If, if I'm the only one out there, obviously uh, it's a one-off discussion, but I'd like to be part of that conversation to see what the priorities are, what the other options out there. I'm sure there are a number of items on CIP lists that um, are also important and, uh, and be part of that conversation rather than just like, here's a, you know, take it or leave it sort of a proposition. So I'd like to table this. Um, I'm not making the motion yet. I'd like to hear from a few other counselors just until the next meeting, get a feel for it, have that conversation. And maybe, uh, you know, maybe we come back to the same place, but um, I know there's a lot of other good projects on that list as well. Right. And there definitely are a lot of good projects and in, in the list, we've seen the list, I believe it's in uh, the budget that was adopted in May. Um, but also looking at at least the first three, um, actually, let me take that back. When you're, some of these CIP um, projects, you know, you put $25,000 in this year, you put $25,000 in next year. Eventually the $400,000 project by the time five years is up, you know, it's now worth, you know, $475,000 to do the job. At least the first without the compensated absences, 28, 78 figure, but the 70, 50, and 80,000, those are projects that will be completed um, that, you know, we're not putting money aside in anticipation that we'll put more money next year and then a little bit more money the following year to get it off the CIP list. These three um, were, you know, priorities that we could get done with the proper allocation this year. Also, you know, if you look down at the, the last uh, figure at the bottom, it's the lapsing, uh, lapsing funds to the fund balance, 756, 752 number. You know, we are putting money back to the um, fund balance. There was some concern uh, by members back in May when we adopted the budget that the um, fund balance would be close to that 10% number, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, we are, you know, I think our um, auditors like us to be anywhere from the seven to ten percent, and uh, I don't have the number right in front of me on that list, but I think it brings us up to about ten point eleven uh, five six. Excuse Oops. me, eleven, 11 five six. Yep. Yeah, we are the original number we did look at was about ten and change, but this actually brings us up even higher to eleven point five six. Um, so, you know, we did want to put some money aside for, you know, the just in case um, uh, rationale that uh, you never know where mid year budget cuts from the state may actually impact uh, our town budget. Um, as well, we don't know what uh, other expenses, both, you know, from the Board of Ed side or from the town side, 
would be necessary uh, due to the situation that we are um, um, faced with. Uh, we wanted to make sure that that uh, fund balance was uh, healthy enough, so we put the, uh, the 756000 back into it. I don't know if anybody else had any questions about it or if anybody had a motion. I did hear Matt talk about a possible motion table. This. Mike. Does anybody have any comments? Mike, do you Or I'm sorry, is that Matt? It's a deputy. Oh. I'm not comfortable. I'm not comfortable with the fifty-five thousand dollars for the Keisha Farm Master Plan. I think that money is not likely to be used in the near future. Um, can't see having public meetings on what to do with Keisha Farm when we uh, can't meet in public. Um, I'm also against spending money on a plan that's likely to sit on the shelf for many, many years to come. Uh, I know the Millwood's master plan was done 10, maybe 15 years ago. And right now on the CIP list is over a million dollars of ball field uh, installations and, and renovations with no chance of that getting done in the near future. And now we're going to talk about more ball fields uh, on Keisha Farm. So I would like to see the 55,000 put back into the fund balance. Okay. Any? Um, Mayor. Um, 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 Mike, if you want to stop the um, screen sharing we can probably have a conversation on this yep yes um mike i apologize i don't have the list of what the other cip projects were that were uh, part of our proposed budget um, but i would like to see which ones were not included um, in the list i won't have I see Tom's got his budget. I do not have my budget. It's in the basement, not in, up, up here with me. Um, but I would love to, to see that list and see what wasn't included. And then the other thing is um, the deputy mayor did mention uh, possibly purchasing police cruisers. Um, is that something that has been decided? Because I'd like, is that what the 150,000 in the reserve is for? How many cruisers can we get with that? Would we be able to bring the fleet up to its regular um, replacement cycle? It, uh, we didn't put the full amount in there, but we uh, included enough for two, two cruisers. And, and what do we normally, what's the normal recyc uh, recycling, listen to me, um, the normal uh, process for police cruisers? Generally, the chief asks for four and we give them three. In the last several years. Last year was kind of a different this where we had a backlog of new vehicles. So we felt they could go without this year. But now but we're, that, putting, we're putting that, enough funds into purchase too. If it comes up that we need them, yes. So the we're not necessarily intending on purchasing them, but you're putting the 150 in with the thought that they could be purchased. Could be used for any vehicles. Rather than lease them, we would purchase them outright. That's why it's being set aside. Mayor? Yes, Dan. I, I just have a question. Amy, I was trying to understand, are you advocating we've put more funds into the police and purchase the cars? I Dan, I've, I've always, yes, I am in favor of keeping with a 
police cruiser replacement schedule. I think it's important that we do replace them on a schedule. I don't want to get to a place in time where we find out we're down cruisers because we haven't kept with that schedule. Um, so my question was whether that that was what those funds were intended for, if we were going to be able to purchase two or three police cruisers this year with those funds. All right, and the other one I was gonna add, Mike uh, Mayor, is I agree with uh, the deputy mayor in regards to removing the funds for uh, Keisha. I think there is a really high quality committee that has been formed of very active members in the community. And I'd love to hear what they have to say and get their input before we really start spending any money on that. And so I would kind of agree with what the deputy mayor said of moving those funds. Okay, well, this is, there's has not been a, um, a motion on that. So, you know, we're discussing it right now. Um, you know, if deputy mayor, if you wanted to make a motion to, move the $55,000 for the uh, consultant, Keisha Farm consultant to budget reserves. Yes, I'll second. make that motion. One second. Okay, now discussion. I'll make a motion to uh, table until the next meeting, a conversation related to this particular item. And I think that will include, uh, so that is my motion. My discussion is, um, I think that could include the conversation about the Keisha farm. I think that there's some legitimacy there and also the other items that are uh, not included in this list, which apparently include other items from CIP, but also other items that may have come across the desk since CIP, just like the high crest boiler room improvements that maybe the town may be needing. So we could have a global conversation about what are our needs from uh, infrastructure point of view, could even include roads, um, and then take input from the entire council and then you know develop a sort of a plan from that. Not that I'm thinking this is a dr dramatic discussion or a dramatic you know committee or anything like that. Just there's a list of, I'm sure, 20, 30, 40 projects, and uh, I'd like to have a conversation with them as a council. Uh, actually, let me just check and see. Gary, there was a motion by- I'm checking in that right now. Tom and seconded by Dan. I don't, there, know if, yeah. I don't Second. know if make a well, motion. Has to be voted on. A table to motion. A table. A motion motion to table, table comes in front of the other, of the other right. motion. A table to motion is always appropriate. Motion to table. Even, even after a second. Sure, because it's 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 holding up this particular motion okay. to get some more data to then reconsider the main motion. It's a secondary motion. Okay. But it doesn't have a second yet. So right now it's just hanging out there and it might be nothing. And I will, I will fully admit that. Mike, by me. Oh, okay. I don't hear a second on yours, Matt. I'll so, second. Okay, yeah. <laughs> was, was there a second? I, I didn't hear. Yeah. Okay. For help. So uh, motion to table. So this would be a vote to motion item. Let me just bring up my agenda. We have a discussion about that or no? You can't, you can. If, if it's a motion to table oh, for yeah. a specific time, you can discuss yeah, it. Yeah, just wanted to know if there was a time sensitive issue for uh, Mike O'Neill for doing these transfers. Thought he said end of September. But your charter requires um, this to be dealt with uh, before the end of September. And then just, uh, you know, uh, less important than that is preparation, you know, of the, uh, of the numbers for the year end audit, which will take place um, in the middle of September. So we typically, uh, we bring this to the council, always bring it to the council in August in hopes that, uh, it puts management in a position to uh, to finalize the numbers for the audit, but uh, as I said, that's a, that's a secondary concern. The charter requirements, primary. Okay, thank you, Mike. So the motion on the floor is to table item B four. 
until the next uh, meeting. That's specific. Once a table till this, the end of this meeting, this is till the next meeting, so we can get more information. Okay. Um, well, I, I'm comfortable with these transfers uh, right now, knowing that um, you know we did look at CIP and we looked at the um, the pri not only the priorities but those that could be fully funded. Um, I would. Uh, uh, encourage the, the council to vote against tabling this to be able to get these uh, taken care of as soon as possible. I know the uh, Charles Wright and uh, Hanmer uh, floors need to be done as soon as possible, uh, as well as the chiller, which is beyond its life cycle. Um, and then obviously the high crest um, HVAC work. So it would be my recommendation that we vote against tabling this uh, for tonight, and then we uh, continue the discussion on the Keisha Farm um, consultant. So, any other discussion on Councilman Force motion to table? I don't know if it's debatable. Oh, okay. It's deba It was debatable. It's debatable because it's yeah. not. It's debatable. All those in favor to table signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. 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 Nays have it. Uh, I believe five or three five. So. And then there is a uh, the first motion on the floor, uh, Deputy Mayor's motion for the uh, Keisha Farm consultant. And I believe it would spend seconded so we can have a discussion. Yeah, may I ask a question? Um, Tom, were you able to, to find the other CIP project list? Gave up. Okay. I can I gave up. <laughs> All I right. Can, I could possibly bring it up, Mary. I thought no. there were I thought there were um, I thought there were a few other projects that Mike beat me to it. That's the list right there. That's the 326 that was taken off the 900. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Would you be able to walk us through our, our all, um, how, how many of these projects would be funded and able to go with the amount that's listed? If I can respond, uh, Amy, I was uh, on the Capitol uh, Committee. <clears throat> so I have some background uh, with these. So the chiller, obviously we're going forward with that. The traffic sign inventory is a uh, state mandated program that is, I shouldn't have used the word mandated. Uh, they want to get it done, but there's not an extreme urgency. It requires the town to hire a, uh, an individual that would go and locate each sign um, electronically put on a, a map of its location, check the reflectivity of the sign and things of that nature. So it's been on, uh, it's been on the back burner for a number of years and um, wasn't a very high priority. The Straddle Hill area road settlement, $25,000, uh, there is 25,000 in there already. Uh, which is enough to cover a uh, engineering study to determine what we're going to do with Straddle Hill. There's a, a large problem with settlement. It goes back to when the road was originally put in and um, MDC has been involved. Can't really find a reason of what's going on. Uh, so we're leaving 25,000 in there because that's enough to get Eric or Derek going on the program. Um, town dam repairs, also the same situation. There's money in there where they can work on one of the dams, do some design work and permitting. Um, engineering's pretty much um, backed up for the entire year with a lot of big projects. So putting more money in wasn't going to accomplish anything. 
uh, the masonry stairs at Webb. Uh, there's a bit of conflict with whether it needs to be done or how bad it is. Uh, Superintendent Emmett was not aware that it was an issue. Um, it doesn't seem to be a high priority for that. Uh, replacing the flooring at Hamner and Charles Wright, as uh, Mike discussed, that money was taken out of that fund to um, fix an emergency leak on, at the South Dean Middle School. And we have put enough money in these transfers to accomplish that work. Um, so that, that work is going to be done, Tom? Yes. Hamner and Charles Wright is going to be done. It's the uh, $80,000. It's the fourth item down. Okay. Yes. So uh, I'll just finish up and then make a general comment. Sure. The um, field at Mill Woods, the money was just going to go into an account and sit there. It was not enough money to actually start anything. Uh, community center. I'm not sure about that one. Uh, I apologize. I don't think that was enough money to do the job. Uh, nature center sidewalk and ADA uh, concrete ramp. Again, there's a little bit of a debate as to if it needs to be done, what's the priority. It's serviceable at, I should say, in my opinion, it's serviceable right now. It's not a safety issue. And uh, Salmon Wells exterior repairs, again, $25,000 is not going to get us much. So uh, just as a general guideline, we were trying to shift from, and it's not a policy change, but we just wanted to try and focus money on projects that we could start and finish and actually get something done rather than just keep putting these small amounts of money away and, uh, you know, several projects, you know, can't even get off the ground with that. Uh, you do so. What is the, what is the total for the Solomon Wells house? And, uh, you said that was short and then maybe the field was short. I mean, what you, could, you could do is you could take the 55 and parlay it over and then get one of those whole projects done. If that's the sort of thinking, which, I get it. Which, which field does it say? Field no woods. Solomon Wells. I think those are the two items that you mentioned classic, that were. Classic was about 150000 for drainage, if I remember correctly. I don't have it in front of me, but I think that was the. Yeah, 170000 amount was one forty five. Salmon Wells House repairs, uh, total project costs 535,000, appropriated to date 335, proposal was for 50. Uh, we needed uh, 150,000. So that would be where we at, 25 and 55, we would still be uh, short about 80,000. Salmon well, well, we didn't talk about the paving that needed to be done there. Um, okay, any other questions about these uh, items that were in the budget uh, book, that, but not funded? So, um, Mayor, if I may, just, just to get this right, um, town staff, either our engineering department or our physical services to, department has determined that the nature center concrete sidewalk and ADA concrete ramp and the masonry stair replacement at web are not safety issues. Um, I think Sally is on the phone. I don't want to put her on the spot if she's not prepared to answer that, but from the com conversations that I had with folks and uh, deputy mayor had with folks, that that was not a safety um, of the stairs or the um, 
ADA ramp was not a um, priority, a hazard or a um, priority for um, compliance or anything. Um, to answer your question, we have done some repairs to the um, to the stairs, and so at this point, they do not call. They are not um, in a hazardous condition. Sally, can you just clarify to which stairs are you talking? Web or web? Sorry, web. Thank you. I appreciate that. And Deputy Mary, I thank you for going over those um, those those line items. I appreciate it. Okay, we do have a motion on the floor by the deputy mayor to take out the 55,000 uh, Keisha Farm consultant and move that into budget reserves. Can I ask one more question? I'm sorry, I'm, I know I'm talking a lot tonight. Um, before we vote on it, has Keisha Farm been meeting um, like we are via Zoom? Have they had discussions about a consultant? I thought the plan was to form the Keisha Farm Committee and then have them start to meet and then try to vet out a consultant so that they could then work with the consultant and the greater community to determine next steps. So has Keisha Farm been meeting and are they interested? Is, was this their request? Gary. The answer is uh, Keisha Farm has been meeting. We actually had a meeting tonight prior to this. Um, Mayor, um, Mayor um, Rel, um, actually, I'll go back further. Amy, um, uh, you, or Councilor Bello, you're correct. The intent was um, for the Keisha Farms Committee to go through a consultant process to retain a consultant, which they did. They broke down into a subcommittee and actually interviewed six consultants and came to the consensus of, um, of which consultant they felt could bring this information forward, which is where the $55,000 came from. So I think their intention all along has been to bring a consultant on to create um, a number of levels and conversations within the community as to what could potentially go there and look at what market trends may be um, what similar properties have done throughout New England in terms of whether or not they could generate revenue, whether or not um, it would just have to remain as is, as open space and what could actually go there. So the committee itself has been driving this process and has done a fair amount of work to try to get a consultant on board to create that type of dialogue. Um, I do agree with Councillor O'Connor's analysis, which we have a very talented group of individuals, um, but we're talking about a market consultant of a 35 acres uh, to understand what the town of Wethersfield and what the region could possibly sustain on those 35 acres. So it's a little bit um, probably above the pay grade of the volunteers as well as the um, town staff to be able to do that on their own at such a heavy, heavy lift. So by removing this funding, we're basically um, ending the actions of that committee? I mean, I wouldn't say you're ending the actions of the committee. They would go, they would go on uh, with the discussions that they're having today. We met with um, the owner of, oh God, I can't think of the name of the farm, but there is a very similar parcel in Newton, Mass that has been able to develop a revenue generating um, farm um, that you know has some similar concepts based off of what uh, members of the committee were striving for. Um, there was, uh, they're looking to get an individual from the University of Connecticut School of Agriculture to come in to talk about um, other similar systems that could come into place. But what you're going to get is a lot of great ideas, but not enough necessary energy or support behind it or understanding within the community. Um, personally, a lot of members around the table mentioned stuff about being able to visualize what could go there, not just in abstract terms, but actually see it and draw it out and understand what it could be. So it's kind of that visual component with a market component that you could put together with actual um, metrics or, or statistics to determine what, what may or may not do well there. And again, I, I think Councilor O'Connor's point is they're very talented um, individuals, but I think you're looking at something that affects the entire community as a whole and not just the 
can't remember how many members, seven to nine members that are serving on there. Um, and to create that level of dialogue, I don't know if the committee unto itself can do it without staffing. I mean, I'm staffing it. So. Okay. Uh, Councillor O'Connor. Yeah. Um, and Amy, hopefully this will help at least give you an, a reasoning behind mine. I absolutely support the idea of having someone come in and design that professionally. My concern is we go and spend this money now and unless you think the town is willing to invest millions of dollars next year in a referendum to do that work, I'm fearful that we're gonna have to do it all over again a year, two years later when this maybe comes to referendum. This is a huge expense. And that's why I would love to get you know community feedback and hear what they say, what are they recommending? And you know, I look at the type of money we spent on Mill Woods as an example with their design plan. And a lot of that never materialized. And we spent, uh, I, I believe over a hundred thousand dollars on engineering studies and all of that uh, to design Mill Woods. And so my thought is not one of not hiring a consultant is just doing it at the right time. And I just don't think the community of Wethersfield is ready in a COVID time frame of our life to go and vote a multi-million dollar referendum for sports field. As much as I would love to see that happen, I just don't think it's practical and I don't think it's financially viable or feasible in today's times. So that was why I'm not 100% behind that. And, and um, Councilor O'Connor, I would agree that this, you know, in, in a COVID time, we're, we're not in a position to be looking at a referendum. Um, is the consultant, was the thought that the consultant would be um, designing the plans or was it thought that the consultant would um, help drive some of these community-based conversations? And just from the few comments that the town manager just gave us, it sounds like the committee itself is, could possibly be looking at some mixed use if they're, if they're having conversations with uh, revenue generating farmers. And I know at least we as the, the former council had made a commitment that we wanted some of it to be used as ball fields. So um, I guess, you know, um, what's, what's the task of the consultant at this, at this point? What was, what was the plan for, for hiring one? Waiting for my mind to catch up. Um, so when we originally went through this process, it was again to bring um, to create that dialogue with residents to fully understand what first of all the not just the immediate abutters would want but what the community as a whole was interested in um, seeing um, the idea was to get the mix um, mixed feelings and thoughts around the table in terms of what um, long-term plans could be the intent is not for them to do a full level design i'm assuming um, similar to what probably took place at Mill Woods. Um, the, it's not, um, it's, again, it's more of a visioning concept. So uh, when you talk to a lot of these designers, you're exp when they're hearing what the residents are saying, they're starting to paint a picture in their mind and actually draw what um, kind of a design or a sketch as to what it might look like. And then they would come back to the next meeting with the community as a whole, and you could probably broadcast it as easily with Zoom as you could with anything else to show what the visioning process brought out. And the idea was you would have multiple visioning process. So the first would processes. The first would be a general conversation about, okay, what is allowable there versus um, through zoning? Uh, what was the intent of the um, referendum that passed? Um, you know, what complies with the language as well as the zoning regulations are there, create a basic dialogue as to the appetite for the community. Um, the consultant would then do a number of things. They would begin to formulate what that looked like and also do some market research as to whether or not that's a feasible concept. And some of the ideas that have been kicked around when you go out and actually do a pro forma as to what that would cost the taxpayers or what that would cost or would there be interest of a private entity running that. It might turn out that those items are just something you cross right off the list because it doesn't have the capacity to either generate enough revenue or it costs too much to do. 
So it's almost a tool, a two track process. It's one to create the dialogue with the residents and to begin to shape what could go there. And then it's to create the market study to support what the residents believe could do well there or what they'd like to see there. Um, it isn't to create a master plan by any means. You would then probably look to research um, what a master plan, you know, if you were to do a master plan, what the cost would be and how you would fund that. Um, and a lot of these situations where you do this type of visioning, it leads to an opportunity to go after funding, um, state, federal, federal or private partnerships to say, okay, well, this is what we want. Now we have to design it. That's probably more the master plan phase. This is well before the master plan phase. This is the community dialogue and actually some, um, some visual tools to make a determination based off of market data. Thank you. Yep. Okay, uh, Tom. I have raised the question several times as to possible uses of the land particularly in selling off some of the land for residential development. And I have never received a proper answer on that. So I think that's also factors into whether we should proceed with a uh, consultant to come in and gather community input to decide what could go there. Um, I would like to see something that generates revenue in a significant way. Uh, and I would like to get the question answered if we are allowed to sell part or all of the land. Gary, I saw your finger go up. You wanted to make a point or? No, yeah, just uh, to follow up with Deputy, Maz uh, Deputy uh, Mayor Mazzarella's uh, point, I did do some research into that. Um, I'm, I'm about 50% of the way there. The reason why is I have an opinion from from council, but I also have to qualify that opinion against bond council to ensure that they're in agreement. So at this point, we're going to wait to hear from bond council to make sure uh, that we're in agreement because obviously it's tied to bond funds. So I want to make sure that right. before I give you a full answer, um, okay, I have everything in line. Well, it seems to me that there are. You know, there is a capable group of the Keisha Farm Committee already established, correct? And they are actively pursuing, you know, options for the use of uh, the property. Uh, we purchased it, um, finalized it about a year ago, not quite a year ago, if I'm not mistaken, sometime in the end of August of 2000. So it's still, there is still work to be done. Um, you know, we do uh, rely on uh, residents and volunteers who have uh, stepped up to the plate to um, serve in the capacity for, for whatever um, that um, role would be for the Keisha property. I think if um, it's the will of the uh, council to move that or keep that $55,000 in the, or out of uh, the consultant and move it into the um, budget reserve fund, then um, you know, we can go that route. We can obviously look to the committee in the future to um, determine you know, what they are working on, what they are um, deciding and you know, who they are talking to. Um, you know, it's, there, who, who's the liaison to that committee? Who's council liaison to that committee? There isn't one. We no, there it. is not one. And I don't think it is it a formalized, it's an, it, it's an ad hoc committee formed by the town manager. Yep. So, you know. And, and Gary, you serve on that committee? Uh, ex officio ex or? Ex officio, yeah. Yep. Okay. Not a voting member. There is a, a further discussion on the item or on the motion. Okay, there's a motion to remove the $55,000 for the Keisha Farm Consultant into the uh, budget reserve fund. 
motion's been made and seconded. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. 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 Okay. Um, do you, Sue, do you need, I'm trying to see who's on, kind of people jumped off. I believe it was three, nay, five, yay. So hard to tell on Zoom, you know, it's just sort of this garble at the same time. It I, is. I don't it know is. if anyone else can, but I, I can't, to be honest with you. Nope. I, I guess. You, if you told me it was unanimous, I probably wouldn't know the difference almost. Except for the one nay, maybe. Eight to one, whatever. Okay. I think it was uh, five, three, yay. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. Um, moving forward on to the agenda. Uh, we do still have the, the full item 4B to vote on. So now, Mike, I see you down there. You would increase the, uh, decrease the proposed transfers by 55,000, increase appropriations to lapsing uh, fund balance of 55,000. That's right. correct. Yes. So everybody's clear on what we would be voting for. Uh, the, that is now the new motion. Well, do we have to make a separate motion to change how we are appropriating funds? Do we have to put new numbers in? So you made the motion to remove the 55 to bring it back to fund balance. You amended the original motion, right? Right. So. so that was a motion to amend. And now you just voted on, you just voted on the motion to amend. Right. So now you're back to the original motion. Well, now it's amended. As amended. As amended. Yep. <clears throat> Who made the original motion? Um. Well, no, we are no. not sure there was an original motion. No, I didn't make it. I'll make the motion to adopt the budget reconciliation and transfers as amended. Second. All those, in, all those, yep, yeah, no. discuss that. Sure. Mike, I'm going to move to amend uh, the current motion to add $55,000 that was just taken out from the Keisha Farm Master Plan and put it into the Millwoods Master Plan for fields and asked for the ability to summarize why I made that motion. Okay. Uh, did you get a second? I guess I'll I didn't like it. I'll second the motion. Okay. Now discussion. Thanks, Mike. Um, so I've been listening and I got to tell you the Keisha farm removal I was kind of 50 50 on I, I think the points were well made on both sides. Um, thought it was important to have the committee move forward because they've been I thought it was kind of maybe a little pulling of the rug out from under them for the work that they've done but I understand but the, the arguments were sound about the times we're in and being able to move forward and so forth. But in this case, I think that we have we have a master plan and it's already been done. And we are, it sounds like, you know, almost 70, 80% to being able to mm -hmm. make an improvement to the fields at Millwoods Park. And now we have an, uh, a particular set of resources, which, uh, you know, the leadership on our council thought was at least uh, plausible as far as uh, what we have here to be able to, to move it possibly forward with Keisha Farm Master Plan. The council disagreed. Uh, but now we have still have that allocation of resources to be able to use toward Millwoods Park, a park which we have a master plan for, which we've already been saving up for, which in the next budget, we could now have just that little bit more to complete the project. But this amount of money will get us that much closer. And I would say in 12, 18, 24 months, we can create another section of that master plan, which we already have. I listened to Deputy Mayor Mazzarella, and I know that's been a complaint of many, that we create these master plans and then don't implement them. Well, you know what, we have a chance. And so it will be our own fault if we don't use these funds toward implementing a plan which has already partially been implemented 
and taking it to the next phase and support that group of people that did all of that work. So since these funds are already, I think there's a, there's a feeling that they're available to be able to use. Uh, now what we choose as a council to use them on, of course, is you know, easily a subject of debate. Um, that was on the list that we just saw previously and I made that motion accordingly. And I think it would be a good use of those funds and uh, take care of some of the concerns that we had just a second ago with the Keisha master plan. Thanks for listening, I appreciate it. Deputy Mayor. Just to review the, uh, to the best of my knowledge, the Millwood's master plan, which I said 10, 15 years ago, maybe Mr. O'Connor would fine tune that date. But the one item that's on the capital uh, CIP project list is to uh, Millwoods Park soccer field. It's categorized as a priority of 10. Total project cost $625,000. New field per master plan. So if we put $55,000 away to do the next field that's up on the Millwoods master plan, the money's just going to sit there. Yeah, that, that wasn't the alloc that wasn't the allocation though, Tom. It was to the discussion that we just previously had about I believe drainage to a baseball field that was approximately a hundred and something short, and that we were uh, this would approach them to get within about seventy thousand. That was the intention of it, and I may have not been as specific as necessary, but I was hopeful I was specific enough. But it wasn't for the new six hundred thousand dollars soccer field. It was for the other. Uh, and it said field, so perhaps I can understand that. I'm trying to uh, correlate the relationship of these plans that the town puts together and if and when they ever materialize. And uh, that's all. No. Yep. My... So that, that was my intention in the motion. If I need to be more specific, I'm happy to do it. No, you were. But... I see. So. Total project cost of 170,000. Zero has been appropriated to date. So you add that, or subtract the 55 from that, you got 115,000 left to go. Um, yeah, I'm, I, I still, I don't know if anybody else had any discussion. I'm sorry if I'm jumping in front of anybody, but um, I'm still with the uh, mindset that if there's something to be a priority that we could fully fund and get off the uh, CIP project list. Um, I would do that, but I'm also, again, weary of the need for budget reserves when we are um, going into uh, fiscal year 21 with the unknowns that are out there. So um, you know, the motion still is to put the money, well, actually, I guess, you, Matt, what was your motion? Add the $55,000 that was just put into the reserve fund back, but allocate it toward the field improvements to Millwoods, okay. which we Both just the, seen. Okay, and, but the underlying motion is still there from Deputy Mayor to put it into reserve. Okay. It is, oh, well, that was, that's now, the main motion has now changed. I made an amendment. Yep to put the 55 toward that project. Any other discussion? All those in favor of the 55,000 to go to the Mill Woods master plan project of drainage for baseball fields. All those in yes. favor by, by saying aye. 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 Aye, aye. sorry, I'm muted. All those opposed? Nay? Nay. Nays have it. Uh, Sue, it was three yay, five nay. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Further discussion on the motion to take, well, actually now it's been approved with 55,000. This is on item B4, amended. All those in favor of item B4 as amended, signify by saying aye. 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 
Opposed, nay? Nay. No. Okay. Five, yay, three nay. So. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, moving along, I believe we're on item B5. The volunteer fire uh, fighter uh, pension plan. I don't know, Gary, were you or Mike going to talk about this? I can briefly talk about it. This was part of the budget discussion that uh, Chief Bailey came to us with the department head comments. Uh, the additional five hundred dollars uh, on top of the uh, five hundred dollars, which is current uh, contribution towards the. Um, uh, pension plan um, would hopefully uh, serve as a uh, incentive for uh, new volunteers to step forward and volunteer their time and efforts uh, to uh, um, our volunteer fire department. And um, while it was not included in the original budget, we do have um, this before us today. And um, yeah. If Mike or Gary have anything further to say about that um, additional $250. I mean, I would just add that it hasn't been adjusted since 1998, if I remember correctly. So this has been um, kind of level um, for a long period of time. Correct. Yep. Hopefully we would have uh, some people stepping forward. Um, any discussion? Well, actually, we got to have a motion. Motion to approve an increase in the annual basic town contribution for qualifying members of the volunteer firefighters pension plan from five hundred dollars to seven hundred and fifty dollars. Second. Motion has been made and seconded. Any discussion on this item? Seems like a pretty reasonable idea. Yep. And the firefighters do so much work for us. Yep. And, you know, this is kind of cost of living stuff. It's not really a budget player. No. They save us so much money and they're always there for us. They live in town. Mm. It seems like the right move. That's what I got. Okay. We can wonder if we can reach consensus on this one. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Ayes have it. Thank you. Um, we have a substance abuse grant for the uh, social and youth services. Um, I don't know if Erica is on or Kathy. I got to do my scrolling through. Kathy is here. Yep. I'm here as well. This is Erica. Oh, Erica. Okay. Hi. Yeah. Or is you got uh, is for you guys. Um, you want to just tell us a little bit about this, please. Sure, um, Kathy. If you don't mind, I'm gonna start off. I think you're okay with that. Um, good evening, Mayor, Deputy Mayor, Town Council members, and Town Manager. Um, tonight, I have um, an amplified grant, former known as the Capital Area Substance Abuse Grant. Um, we have been getting this grant now for over 10 years, at least. Um, and it's increased a little bit over the years, not much. Um, so we are looking to apply for the same amount we applied for and received in the last fiscal year, which is $5,342. And those funds are used to support um, prevention initiatives with the youth that we serve here in Wethersfield, primarily in the middle school and the high school, but we have been actually doing some work in the elementary school partnering with the DARE program as well. Great. Um, are there any Does anybody questions? Have... Oh, yep. Any questions? Oh, no, go ahead. I was. Council members? Nope. Okay. Um, I do want to add that this actually, in the past couple of years, we've been able to actually regionalize with some towns, um, such as Berlin, Newington, and Rocky Hill, to do some um, work together and pool our, fun our funding together to make it. Um, stretch further. Good. Thank you. Deputy Mayor. Yeah. 
Uh, just a quick question. Uh, I'm not familiar with the capital area substance abuse. Is that a state funded grant or private? Um, so, um, yeah, so this grant comes um, from DEMIS, which is a state grant down to our regional mental health board and um, regional prevention council, which is Amplify. And they are the ones who offer the grants to the local municipalities. Thank you. You're welcome. And majority of the funding that comes through to DEMIS is a lot of times taxes that have been put on um, alcohol taxes, cigarette taxes, and some states it's you know the marijuana taxes, um, and they have to give a portion of that money back to cities and towns um, and states in order to um, put into prevention work. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Nope. Okay. Can I get a motion? To motion to authorize the town manager to apply and accept a local prevention council grant to provide prevention programs for the students in Weathersfield in the amount of $5,342. Second. Okay. Thank you. Uh, motion's been made and seconded. Uh, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Ayes have it. Okay. Thank you. And Erica, I think you and Kathy are still up for the DCF grant. Correct. Um, is, can I jump right in or is there sure. anything else before that? Okay, wonderful. Um, so this is also a grant that we have been getting now for about five years. Um, and this has um, really goes to focus on our juvenile review board that we have run here in town oh, for many, many years, 20 plus years. Um, in the last couple of years, we have seen um, an increase with state mandates um, that no longer are handled at the court level, but are handled with um, local juvenile review boards and within the community as a whole so that it's less punitive for our young adults um, here in town and our youth. Um, so with that being said, um, they are allo um, allowing opportunities for grant funding because of those unfunded mandates that have come down from the state level to help us with our case management and um, different types of programs that to put into place for our youth and our families that come through our juvenile review board process. Um, and we will apply again this year for the $9,000 that we applied for last year and received as well. Okay. Now, is this a competitive grant? And would there be, is the 9,000 enough to handle these case management? Uh, um, we've been able to, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, just the, the case management alone for the town, the 9,000 is enough. We definitely make it stretch, um, but we have um, some other funding um, grants that we are able to tap into from like the state um, department of children and families and um, the SDE, state department of education that we're able to tap into as well if, um, we were to need more funding. Okay. Did anybody else, Deputy Mayor? Yeah, Erica, I'm, I'm new to all this, so bear with me, but. No problem. Can, can you give me an idea of what the money is actually, how is it spent? Is it for salaries or? Uh, just sure. Yep, yeah. so we actually do um, have a, uh, minimal part-time case manager that is um, has a master's and is clinically focused to work with our youth and families on cases, um, which is minimal hours. So it's between like 10 and 15 hours a week, depending on our caseload. We have also used funding to allow youth to get into specialized programs for mental health, um, substance use, that if their insurance are not covering it, or um, they have high deductibles, we're able to utilize that funding for that. If we want to get a child involved in a pro-social activity um, in order for them to um, have better outcomes and um, 
there not be another arrest or um, incident that occurs, we can get them involved in a pro-social activity if family um, does not have the funding to support that or afford that themselves. Does that help? Yep, absolutely. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions or comments about this? Okay. And, you know, I'm kind of new at this as well, um, not having served on any of the um, committees where um, social and youth services uh, committees. The uh, juvenile, review, juvenile Review Board that is uh, part of the town that is composed of the staff, do they meet regularly, Erica? We do, yes. Obviously, given um, the situation with COVID, it's been a little more difficult and we are doing some remote um, meetings and also um, with permission, some Zoom meetings with youth just to keep, um, you know, the case management going and the support for the families. But yes, um, in normal circumstances, we do meet um, at least twice a month with the team, which is made up of stakeholders in the community and community members. Um, and we are able to work with the families and the youth as well during those, um, those meetings. Okay. And has this during period uh, while COVID-19 is uh, prevalent, are the, the, is the youth, are they being serviced? Are they, you know, meeting with their case management officials? Um, I mean, you're kind of taking it out of the court's hands and, and doing it on your own is what I'm getting. Is that what's... Yeah. Yeah, actually, um, it's... Um, it, it has been working out well. We've been doing it over the phone, emailing, um, we've been using Zoom as well. Um, a lot of triaging families and youth over to different services in the community. Um, a lot of clinical services, a lot of um, substance use services that are still happening um, and making do even with COVID. Um, so yeah, we're keeping on top of all that. We're checking in with the school system, the school social workers, um, the support services to kind of make sure that all around the youth and the family's needs are being met. Great. Um, well, it seems to me that this should continue and that, um, uh, you know, maybe Councilman Forrest would know better, but I don't know if court staff are, courts are open to handling these cases right now. I know some attorneys who are working on juvenile matters that have had cases before um, Connecticut's court system prior to COVID that are still waiting uh, while courts are, uh, are closed and, and slowly opening. So I think this is probably a service that uh, uh, may be well needed, especially right now during this uh, period. So. Absolutely. Okay, any further comments at all? Questions? Okay. Um, can I get a mo? Was, no, I don't believe there was a motion. Is there a motion? Yes. Oh, there. We did do a motion on this. Oh no, no, no. there needs to be a motion. Yeah, I think oh. we just did the intro of what the Erica gave an intro of what the resolution or the uh, end item was. So you do need a motion. Okay. Can I get a motion? Motion to authorize the town manager to apply for and execute all documentation related to accepting a Department of Children and Families grant of $9,000 for assistance to our juvenile review board. Second. Okay, motion's been made and seconded. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. Ayes have it. Thank you. Thank you, Erica. Thank you. Have a nice, thank you. Have a nice evening. I appreciate it. You too. Take care. Take care. Okay. Um, moving along to item B6. This is the um, basketball and tennis courts at um, both Standish Park and Greenfield uh, at the community center. Um, Kathy Bagley, uh, did you want to say some things about these projects that are going on right now? Sure, the, the um, Standish, this is for the Standish tennis court and basketball court. 
and the Greenfield basketball court. And currently the Standish, the Standish tennis courts are currently closed because of the large cracking that we have on the surface at this time. And um, the cracks on the basketball court at Standish are getting worse. And the Greenfield ones aren't quite as bad, but we want to attend to them before they get much worse. Because every, every year that we delay, what happened with the Standish tennis courts is we were waiting and waiting to get it done. And then finally, it's, it's costing a lot more to do it. So we're looking to do these three courts to get them done and bring them back, and particularly to open the Standish tennis courts. OK. Councilwoman Bella. May I ask a related question? Um, I've had residents ask me when the hoops are coming back on basketball courts in town. Um, and I, I'm assuming it's one of the phase in steps, but um, I noticed on a, on a walk that uh, Mikey's place, the fencing is down and people are enjoying Mikey's place, but that the, the basketball court, um, the hoops aren't up. Is there a plan for when that'll when that'll occur? Go ahead, Kath. <laughs> we're, we're every week we evaluate the um, the opening of the basketball courts. They're the last thing to open, and the word that we get from some communities is with with theirs open, they're getting thirty to forty and fifty kids showing up at the courts. So we're a little nervous about opening them because of that and also because they're a lot more of a close contact sport than other play than other sports that we've opened so we're we're wrestling with that every week with our um, emergency operations team to make that decision to open them thank you thank you kathy on that and kind of Follow up. I don't know if anybody saw the most recent study. There's a study out of Georgia. I think it's the University of Georgia that broke down by county a party of 100 people getting together and the prevalence of them getting COVID in that group of 100. And Hartford County was at 39% of that group of 100 possibly get COVID if they are in that that just group of just 100 people interacting. Um, so I've had those same questions posed to me about basketball. And, uh, you know, that's one of the most close contact sports um, there is. So I think that would be one of the, the last of the sports to, to reopen. Um, and again, we're getting um, advice from uh, Charlie Brown from the uh, health district as well on that. And uh, yeah, until it's feasible, I think uh, to prevent any kind of spread, unfortunately we would have to keep those closed until that point, um, which is perfect because, you know, both those uh, basketball courts will be closed while this project is going on. And, uh, and it would be good to see the uh, Standish uh, tennis courts being redone. I actually walked over by it the other day and, there's a gap that's probably about three to four inches wide in one of them. Um, any other comments about these uh, courts at all? Anything? Okay. Um, can I get a motion to approve these? I'll, I'll make a motion, Mike. Uh, I make a motion to approve the repair of the Spanish tennis courts and Spanish and Greenfield basketball courts. I'll second, second that motion. Oh, thank you. Seconded. Uh, motion's been made and seconded. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Ayes have it. Thank you. Who seconded? Uh, I Councilman. Did. Councilman Forrest. Councilman Forrest. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. Um, and Kathy, while you're still on the phone, do we know when? Uh, this work will be started? Um, <clears throat> I hope shortly we're going to, we'll talk with the company tomorrow. They were, um, they, they had told us they were able to get the work done um, in the early fall. And it, the sooner we got back to them, they might be able to fit it in. 
Okay. That's great. I think the last courts that were done were over at Webb School and they came out really nice. So. Yes. Good. Looking forward to it. Okay. Thank you. Yep. No, thank you. Scroll down. I believe we are up for um, HVAC work, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Highcrest School, this is the uh, what we had talked about earlier, the uh, work to be done to bring HVAC up to code at Highcrest School. Um, Sally, I think I saw you on uh, the call. Yes. Uh, if you could just fill us in with some of the uh, details for this and maybe um, you know a timeline for when we could uh, start it and have it completed. Towards the end of the, um, well, I guess the end of the year happened in, in March for students, but during this winter, we did have a um, CO uh, alarm go off at Highcrest. We had a response from um, CNG and our building officials. Um, one of the, some of the systems had failed. Um, they need significant repairs. In order to do those repairs, new codes got kicked in. Uh, the systems are currently not grandfathered in. So therefore, in order for us to bring the boilers back online for this coming winter, we need to do uh, a significant amount of work um, to improve the air system. And while we're there as part of this project, not only to make that air system code compliant, but also to be able to update the controls on it, which will give us uh, additional availability for energy management also to wrap the piping in that room. Um, we are, we did put the, the we had an engineer do uh, work with us to put out an RFP. We got competitive, competitive pricing and bids. Um, the bidder who was the lowest, most responsible price is tradesmen of New England who have a very good reputation. I've worked with them before. And we um, would set up a, pre-con meeting um, almost immediately they are ready willing and able to start this project and make it happen great any questions for sally on this? councilwoman bella um so this project if if students go back to school um september 1st or whatever the new date is this project will be completed by then uh, by September 1st, probably not, but certainly it will be done before we need to turn the heat on. And it's a project that can be done at the, as, at the same time as students yes. are in the building. Yes, Thank it's you. in a separate part of the school. Students are no, would, no, would not be near where they would be doing the work. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions for Sally on this? And you said, uh, Sal, you worked with tradesmen of New England already. They've done projects. Come yes, they were they were the primary contractor when I was the facilities director uh, at Trinity College. They have years of experience. Um, only had good experiences with them. They're knowledgeable. They do uh, quality work. They clean up after themselves, which is always a good thing. Um, and they're always available uh, whenever we need whenever I needed them. Okay. And they're at 60 and we just budgeted 70,000 in the uh, budget transfer. If I'm not mistaken, Gary. Yes. This will cover the 70, we'll cover the 63,000. Okay. Good. Anybody else with any further discussion on this? Oh, can I get a motion? We'll make a motion to award the contract in the amount of $63,061.57 to tradesmen of New England LLC, Bloomfield, Connecticut, and to authorize the town manager to execute all documentation related to the said contract. Second. Great. The motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. Ayes have it. 
Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Sally. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Um, and then the last three items are all kind of together. Um, I don't know if we want to speed up the process and have Derek just talk about all of them together and then we can make each individual motion. Uh, but this is for the fall paving fall 2020 program. So it would be starting soon. Uh, back lane, golf road and Coleman. Um, this is out of the, uh, CNF, the CNEF pavement fund. And it looks like it's close to $900,000 for the, the three streets and the, the total project. Um, Derek, if you would, can you just give us a, an idea of what's going on for this and uh, also a timetable for um, start and hopefully completion soon? Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. I'm here as I usually come before you before our paving program for the fall. Um, as was mentioned, there's three items. Uh, this program is funded by the local road tax levy and state funds through Town Aid Road and LOSIP. Um, as mentioned, we're doing back lane from Prospect Street to Whipperwill Way, Golf Road from Prospect Street North to about 1,200 feet north of Cider Brook Drive, and Coleman Road from Silas Dean Highway to Longview Drive. These were Roads were chosen uh, as part of our program just due to either high volume, um, they all have poor pavement conditions, and coal mineral in particular is following an MDC water main project. Um, we had held off on doing this road until they were done. They're all in bad enough shape that we're doing reclaim, so there's no milling with this program. It's uh, strictly a reclaim program just because the roads had deteriorated too far uh, to mill them and repair them that way. So for the first item for bituminous concrete, as we have done in the past, like a lot of municipalities, we use the state contract. We get, uh, because of the higher volume, we get lower, lower pricing. Um, so as it was in the spring, it's the same contract we used. Tocon was the low bid. They were about six to 10% lower than they were last year. Um, <clears throat> and uh, they had worked for us in the spring. So we're recommending using them again, similar to what we've been doing in recent years. Uh, for the reclamation item, as I said, there's no milling. This is the same state contract that's been in place last year and this year. They did a two-year contract. Um, as we've done in the past, we're recommending to use Tocon as the contractor as well. Um, so we're using the same contractor for both re reclaiming and paving. Um, that's particularly important when we're doing reclaim because of grinding up the road, they're regrading. We have drainage issues that arise from time to time. And it's just really best to have the same contractor responsible for all that work. Otherwise, there's going to be a lot of finger pointing going on. So. We've had pretty good luck with them and we would recommend using them again. And then our third component of the paving program is uh, general paving. Um, as you know, they've been working in town for many years. Uh, right now they're working under a town contract that expires in 2021. Um, these unit prices that they're, uh, they offered us in the extension are about 10% lower than their 2014 bid prices. They do minor drainage improvements, road patching, curb and apron replacements and also removing excess reclaimed material. Once the road's reclaimed, we have to get some of the material off site so we can keep the road elevations the same as they were before construction. So they assist with that. And they also help our staff manage the program um, and coordinating with the contractors. So for those three, um, as mentioned, the total cost of the program is estimated to be about a million dollars. Um, the program this year was pretty aggressive. We were looking to spend about 1.8, and I think we're going to end up being at about that amount when we're done. Okay. Thank you, Derek. Thank you, Derek. Any questions for Derek on this? Deputy Mayor? Uh, good evening, Derek. Um, Coleman Road. So, Last week and this week, they are uh, repaving the temporary patches with permanent patches on the uh, entirety of Coleman Road. So is there an opportunity to work with MDC and their contractor to say, why bother cutting out temporary patches and putting permanent patches in when we're going to rip the road up uh, in the fall. Is that just yeah. the way the contracts are awarded so 
get around it? No, that's a good question. Um, my understanding, because I've had conversations with them about this, usually when we're going to come in and reclaim a road, we only have them do a temporary patch because we're going to grind it all up anyway. So from Silas Dean Highway to Longview, at least what my understanding was, I haven't been out there to see it, they were only going to do temporary repairs. From uh, Longview Drive to Wolka Hill Road, they were going to do permanent repairs because that section of the road is in better condition and not part of our program. Uh, from what I saw, they were continuing down towards the South Dean Highway. They, well, like they, you said, from Walcott Hill to Longview, they did, a, I guess, a permanent patches, what you call it. They recut the uh, trenches and, and uh, put the finished coats down. But uh, they're now, this afternoon, I saw them, they were working on Longview to South Dean. So it appears they're doing the whole street. Well, I've told them two times that that was the plan. Um, they were aware of it because they didn't want to permanent patch those areas for that reason, because we're going to rip them up anyway. So if they're doing that, that's their decision, but that wasn't something we directed them to do. Maybe this is something we could call MDC and tell them, you know, this could be a, a cost savings measure if you're putting permanent fixes on something that's going to be dug up in about three months, then maybe we can, you know, I, with them. I'm not an expert on paving, so maybe they're redoing some of the temporary patches and not the full, full boat. But um, when, when MDC did Mill Street, uh, to Middletown Avenue, didn't we like coordinate with the contractor so that we would, uh, you know, get the whole road done at the same time and, and MDC would kick in some of the money for it. Yeah, because with their contract, they were only doing full reconstruction on very limited parts of the road and we needed to do the road anyway. So rather having a bunch of patchwork out there, uh, we negotiated with them and they ended up paying the town, I think it was $128,000 in lieu of them doing that work so we could do it all in one shot as part of our program. Right. But we do work with them. I mean, we meet with them regularly. They they see our paving lists usually two, three, four years ahead of time because we try to. That's why we try to set a program and stay close to it so the utilities can plan. So we do work with them. And like I said, we're in particular with Coleman, we've spoken with them twice about it. So I'll find out what they're doing tomorrow. But um, that was the intention. We do try to save them. You know, we think it's in the, everybody's best interest if they don't need to spend money that they don't. You know, it's not needed. Then we work with them on that. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Derek. Thank you, Tom. Any other questions about um, just the um, item B10, which is the 525,000? Nope. Okay. Can I get a motion for this item? A motion to approve the increase of PO 2017680 by $525,000 based on the aforementioned state awarded contract with Tilcon Connecticut Inc. Oh, Tom? I think it's 460, isn't it? <clears throat> I have 525 in the agenda. I had 520. Cost is 525, but you're increasing the PO by 460 or am I looking at the wrong whatever you do don't know anybody second it because if they just have to change the number we got to go back and do an amendment <laughs> so let's get the number right withdraw it get the number right and then somebody second it Tom which one are you on the 575 yours says 460 525 I'm oh, sorry B five. B8 Cost says 525 and it says- you're, you're on an old agenda. Okay, apologize for that. Oh yes, I see, yes. You're looking at the uh, draft, draft agenda. It was not, it's not B8 anymore. We moved uh, in the, yeah, B10. 525, yep, good. Okay, at 525, make it a second? Second. Okay, motion's been made and seconded. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. 
Got to get a little bit of life, guys. I know we're two and two hours forty minutes into this, but uh, we only got two more left. Excuse me, Mike. Excuse me. I'm sorry, Mike. Oh. Can you tell me who seconded? I I couldn't tell. Yes, uh, it was motion was made by uh, Pat and seconded by uh, Tom Mazzarella. Okay, thank you. Councilman Pentelo, Deputy Mayor Mazzarella. Okay, item B11. Again, this is the uh, reclaiming. Uh, Derek, anything new to add to this? No, I just you know briefly went through it. This is uh, this is again a state contract uh, using Tilcon uh, for the reclaiming portion of the work. Okay. Any questions about reclaiming going forward? Okay. Get a motion. Motion to increase the PO2017-6879 by $100,000 based on the aforementioned state awarded contract with Tilkin Connecticut Inc. Second. Okay, motion's been made and seconded by Pentelo and then Mazzarella. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Better. Opposed, nay. Ayes have it. Thank you. And then finally on this, the um, work for drainage, curving and aprons, uh, I believe, um, 275,000. This would be the final um, portion. And then Derek, is this, when is this slated to begin? I mean, that, you know, what, what is our hope for this? Well. Right now, we're scheduled to begin either the first or second week in September. Um, that may fluctuate, but we're hoping to start early September so we can have the program wrapped up by middle of October. Okay. Um, and then actually, um, uh, what is, what's the status of the work that's actually going on or should be going on for um, Highland Street to the Rocky Hill line? Where are we with that? Uh, that is going out to bid tomorrow. Um, so we're hoping to have a bid opening in late August. Um, we were waiting for DOT to give us the final authorization to bid, um, which took a little longer than I thought it would. So we're still moving forward with the plan to start construction uh, at some point in September, it'll be a September, October uh, type of project, similar to the paving work. And is Tilcon doing that one as well? That's gonna go to bid. So. You know, oh, they may okay. be one of the bidders, but it'll yep. be publicly bid. Okay. Maybe if they're already here for back lane over there and, um, well, golf, yeah, golf, back lane, they're both on the same side. So maybe if they can do it, they can get it all done in one shot, having the equipment already over there. Um, okay. Any further discussion about this? portion of the bid. Okay, hearing none, uh, can I get a motion for this one? Sure, I might as well finish off the night, right? Motion, motion to increase PO2017-6881 by $275,000 based on the previously awarded contract with general payment. Second. Okay, motion's been made and seconded. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. I have it. Thank you, Derek. We appreciate it. Thank you. Have a good night. Yes, you too. Thank you for sticking around. No problem. And then finally for minutes, I'll give you guys some time to review the minutes if you haven't already. Did anybody have any questions, comments, or concerns about the July 6th minutes? Hearing none, could I get a motion to approve the uh, minutes as submitted? So moved. Motion, okay. Councilman Pentelo. Can I get a second? Second. Second by Councilman O'Connor. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 
Aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. Ayes have it. Motion. Abstained. Oh, sorry, Matt. Abstained. Okay. Motion carries seven to one or seven zero one. Okay. Uh, Gary, do we have anybody on the line for final five minute public comments? Uh, we've got. Area code eight six zero five six three six nine two three. Uh, good evening again. This is Bob Young from uh, Twenty Copper Mill Road. Um, first of all, I uh, I guess this was a quite a long meeting, uh, a lot of discussion on spending, and I'm really amazed at the discussion about. $55,000 for consultant fees for the Keisha Farm. The Keisha Farm was bought on the, on the whims of politicians not providing ample information and lied to us as citizens. And, and, if, and, and if the citizens had known back then, and if we were given the appraisal back then, when, they, when it was presented, at the public hearing, it would never have passed. From what our research shows, the, the, the appraisals, they had two appraisals back then that were equaled $1.7 million. And we bought the property, or I should say, the town council negotiated $2.4 million. I think that's criminal on the part of the Bellow administration headed up where they're good friends uh, at that time and to push it through and, 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 and did not tell us. And they, hood, they stood behind whatever, not providing to the citizens. And now look, $55,000 to have a consultant come in and tell Miss Bellow what we, should, what we should be doing with that property a property that we should never have bought. But because of her, because of her and her colleagues like Mr. Mr. Matthew Forrest and whoever else that sat up there with them, they all knew it was only appraised at $1.7 million and, and they negotiated 2.4. I don't think anybody would have voted for that piece of garbage property at that kind of a price. And I think now $55,000 because we need, we have some ad hoc group of special interest people who want to push forward and, and complete the Bellow project up there on uh, whatever street, on Gris on whatever that street is up there, Highland Street in Collier. That's a disgrace. And furthermore, to hear the town manager tonight talk about the Keisha farm and generating revenues. I've heard that several times tonight, generating revenues. What town, what Weathersfield has, in Weathersfield, what have you generated in revenues? The, read the words revenue, generating revenues is a, is a uh, nothing else but baiting the taxpayer, baiting, baiting the taxpayer to go along with a crooked deal. And that's exactly what we have here, a crooked deal. And now we have $55,000 that Miss Bellow and Mr. Forrest were big proponents tonight to spend on that piece of garbage property that we never should have bought. And of course, the town manager, again, generating revenue what a joke how about Catone Field we heard about all the great economic development we were going to get from Catone Field if we put turf and lights on that property on that field how much economic development did we get we got nothing absolutely nothing how much generated revenue Mr. Mr. Manager, do we get from Catone Field and all the games that they play, all the gate receipts that come in, all the food that is sold? What do we as taxpayers get in return for these few people, the minority in town, to have a good time? 
And that's what it's all about. For young, if you minorities could... need to have a good time on the rest of us. And I think it's pretty poor. And now Miss Bello is running for state senator or state representative. What a okay. joke she's going to be. She fits in well up there with all those criminals. Okay? And and listen, you know, I waited all night long to talk, Mr. Mr. Mayor. You know, and I know you were part of that as well, the Keisha Farm. Mm-hmm. But I will hang up since uh, oh, no, don't you don't want really to hear from me. But I will come back. I will come back and we'll continue discussing the Keisha Farm. And we're Please. going to con- we're going to talk about the MDC as well, another dishonest group. Thank you very much and good night. Thank you. Thank you. Staying on. Anybody else? I have one more phone number, 860-838-1453. Good night, uh, Mr. Mayor, town board members, and to the town manager. I'm Paul Brady from 1618 Church Street. I felt compelled, number one, to talk about this issue, the issue of policing. I know there's been a lot of talk and a lot of folks have also politicized the issue because Black Lives Matter and everyone's been coming out and protesting. Now, I would first like to say thanks to the police officers for their job that they have done in keeping us safe. Under no way, shape or form, Am I for defunding, defunding the police department or reducing the number of police officers in our town? However, I do believe that our police officers need to be adequately trained in the area of race and how to deal with certain situations. For each of you sitting up on that board, I don't think any of you ever had to tell any of your children when they go out what not to do and what and how to behave when they see a police officer, especially if they're driving and being, and they're they're about to be pulled over. You guys need to understand that for four generations in this country, minorities have been targeted, abused in many ways, by police officers. So naturally that fear is there. However, this is a teachable moment. So I am imploring all of you to take the first step and to stand up, to speak up, and to denounce racism in the town of Wethersfield and work with the police department to put in place steps and proper ways for them to do policing. For, for instance, police, de- police departments have assets forfeiture funds. They need to somehow learn to put on community events to create better community relations. There is no reason why a child should be at school and have to be worried about a police officer, something wrong, happened and them being judged the wrong way or being mistreated. These are all things that need to stop. And I must say, I am very disappointed of every single person that's sitting on that board, every single person, the way how this issue of race has been handled in this town. None of you sitting there have taken the steps or to say anything, to come out publicly to say you're denouncing any type of racial behavior that is not right in the town of Wethersfield. Before I go, I would like each of you to think about this because about 90% of every black kid in this country had to see what happened to Mr. Floyd. I want you all to think about, close your eyes and picture it when you tuck your kids in at night. If that police officer was kneeling on a white person, what the reaction would have been in this country, what the reaction would have been if it was in the town of Wethersfield. I would also have you guys think about the fact that that same police officer could have been a police officer that we put in our schools. Police officers need to be properly trained. 
before they go into our schools, before they deal with the community. Remember, their job is to serve and protect. Not the other way around. They're not mobs. They're not gangs. They're here to protect the citizens. And as leaders, you guys are there to lead. So I'm asking each of you there, do the right thing and make that first step. And the first step is to stop, listen, and listen to the people, the people who are being oppressed. There's no way the majority who has no idea what it's like to be a black person in this country, in this town, for when you walk into a grocery store, it doesn't matter if you're a lawyer or a teacher or what you do that you have someone following you around the aisle because the thought is you're going to pick up something. Or for your kid to go somewhere and somebody asks, oh, do they belong there? White kids aren't asked that question. So black kids shouldn't be asked that question because after all, we're all equal in this country. Without further ado, that's all I have to say to you guys. Have a good night and thank you for your service. Thank you. Appreciate it. Anybody else, Gary? Just looking because there's a flip. No, nope. it looks like that is it for callers. Okay. We did have a couple people who did write in earlier. Um, I think they were all either emailed to us earlier. I don't think any of these are new from today, but Lynn had emailed them to us in the past. Um, Sue, do you have those on I hand? Do. I do. Okay. Um, so let's see. We had um, one regarding um, a dying ash tree hazard at 357 Garden Street. That was from uh, Robert Monstream of 357 Garden Street. Um, and then we had um, Carolyn uh, Akari McCarthy from 123 Stillwood Drive. Um, she's a member of the Weathersfield uh, Women for Progress. And she was um, in support of the resolution to declare racism a public health emergency. Um, Shannon Roach also uh, wrote about standing against racism and having people um, change their views and treat everyone equally. Um, there were several, uh, three I believe, speaking on behalf of Chief Satran and his uh, good character and being an honest and fair person. It was Jack Goldberg from 354 Hangdog Lane, uh, Rebecca Coelho, no address given, and Clement A. Ball from 96 Broad Street. And I think that's it. Okay. That was what I had. So, and then um, I have a town clerk update. Quickly. Please. Okay, so we've been extremely busy. Um, so we finished out the end of July with, um, I'll start with the low numbers of the dog licenses, uh, 1,284 dogs and the late penalty of a dollar starts this month due to, instead of July due to the governor's executive order. Um, now I'll move on to the absentee ballots. Um, the good news is uh, the ballots are finally start starting to be delivered and we were actually receiving ballots today in the drop box. Um, so this morning there were two and then we ended up with probably, I don't know, maybe 40. Um, the applications, we've received 3,033 absentee ballot applications, um, but we did find out and we actually got a definitive number today that 141 of those that were supposed to be mailed out through the mail house were not sent by the mail house. So uh, we have to process those. Um, I'm hoping to get them all out tomorrow. Um, and I- Do you know those 141? Uh, yes, yes, we have the name. Okay. okay. Um, they, they, the state changed their list um, 
and they actually gave us all the names instead of having us try to hunt through the 265,000 to figure it out. So <laughs> that was helpful. Um, and I guess that's it. The only other thing is there are also um, thank you letters are being written at this time for um, those who aren't returning to any of the boards and commissions. So, and, and land records are still through the roof. Oh, okay. And I think that's it. Okay. Any questions for um, Sue while she's at it? I know this is, uh, we appreciate your efforts. I know going into, uh, we got a primary in just about a week, week tomorrow. Yeah. Um, some people on this call are counting those days down by the day, by the second. Um, but yes, that is uh, coming up uh, relatively quickly. We do appreciate your hard work. I know you and I talked today earlier, Sue, about um, everything that you guys are doing to try and make sure the uh, applications come in and are sorted in order and uh, um, ballots go out as, uh, as quickly as possible. Is there a deadline for your office to get ballots out to um, voters? Well, we... We need to get them out. We usually do within 24 hours. This 141 that we just got is going to be a real um, crunch to get those out. And we'll do absolutely everything we can to do that. Um, but getting them out, um, because we have the Dropbox and people are able to do that as opposed to the mail, um, you know, we try to get them out when we get them in. It, and it doesn't matter. Um, if we get one the day before election day, we still put it out in the mail. So a as the applications come in, the ballots go out. Okay. Uh, and they need to be back in our office by 8 p.m. on election night. So that will be, you know, at 8 p.m. I'll empty the box one more time and that will be the end. Gotcha. So. Okay. And applicate, both applications and completed ballots can be dropped off in the uh, drop box. Absolutely. And you, yep, and you check the applications a couple times a day. Yep, three, yep. four times a day. Gotcha. So. Okay. Thank you. Oh, sure, you're welcome. Anybody else? Okay. I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Oh, so moved. So moved. Uh, Councilwoman Bella, can I get a second? Second. Somebody. <laughs> All right. Uh, Councilwoman Bello, uh, seconded by Councilman Forrest. All those in favor of adjournment, say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Ayes have it. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks guys. Thanks for calling in and being here all night for us.